What is up, Fence fam? So good to see you guys again, virtually, as it were. Uh, yeah, we are on a roll here. Well, I think we're on like three or four weeks in a row. So I am, I tell you what, Saturday mornings, I bounce out of bed. I'm not kidding. I was up before my alarm this morning because I was so excited to come talk to you guys. Being a part of the live is just the highlight of my week. I'm super serious about that. So without further ado, see you all's here. Joe Rivers wins first comment of the session. He was here like half an hour before the live. My favorite show of the week. Can't wait. Joe, same. My favorite show of the week as well. I appreciate you being here. From Straight Arrow Fence in Florida. Man, you Florida guys, I tell you, you, I say this every time. I'm jealous. Project Mail Music. Hey, Joe and everyone. Hello, Project Mail Music. All the way from the UK. So I guess it's good afternoon to you then. Hope everything is going well over there. Truth Seeker, good morning from Nashville, Tennessee. One of my favorite places to go. Mainly because St. and Seal Experts is there, but when we're there to visit St. and Seal Experts, sometimes we'll uh, we'll sneak down to Broadway and see a show or two. Always a good time. Dan Wheeler in the house from, well, it used to be the first and only podcast for the fencing industry, but now there's a couple out there. And... Dan keeps twisting my arm to turn this into a podcast as well. So, Dan, it's on the list. I, I already told you that, but I'm telling you that publicly. It's on the list. Uh, Dan and I are working on some, we've got some things in the works with his podcast that I am super excited about, and I am I will tell you guys just as soon as I'm able. Dan says, first nice day in two weeks, fighting rain, snow, and water-filled holes. Isn't that, isn't that spring? And it's so, so far this week, we have had, we have had rain. And then uh, yesterday we had a little bit of a snow flurry or two days ago we had snow flurries. And then here in two days, it's going to be 70 and sunny. So I don't know, but we're also supposed to have some severe storms scattered in there. So I don't know. Anyway, I feel for you is what I'm saying, Dan. One of the crews here, John Otto, 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 where did that come from? Uh, John's here with us tuning in from right down the road. John is like main man in the shop. One of the main guys, one of the main guys. Uh, there's probably more of the guys watching. So it's the other. Listen, you guys get it. Everybody's rock stars here. But what is up, John? Caserc Distributors, welcome. Well, actually, so they say good morning. Philly is with you. Good morning, Philly. Uh, I'll actually be down in Philadelphia, down over in Philadelphia. Three weeks, something like that. Three weeks, four weeks. I don't know. It's coming up in a hurry, um, so I cannot wait for that. If you guys are in the Northeast Coast, over in the Philly area, come on down for some training. Project Mail Music says, yep, everything is good here in the sunny UK. Well, not often sunny, so look at you guys sunny in the UK. Good deal. Well, guys, let's get this started talking about fencing content. If you guys have fencing-related questions, Drop them in the comments below. Let's also do this. If you've got a uh, fencing-related story from this week, let's talk about it. Let's chat, let's chat a little bit about fence. We don't have a guest on today's show. I don't have an ad agenda for today's show. It's literally going to be two and a half hours of fencing-related content, a minimum of two and a half hours. Uh, maybe not minimum. You guys get it. Sometimes more, sometimes less. We'll see where the rabbit hole takes us. Craig is here from New Jersey. Craig, welcome, sir. Welcome. Yeah, so springtime's ramping up, guys. I mean, we're starting to see that in the office. Uh, phones are picking up for sure. Uh, we're selling, we've been selling retail wholesale for, we've been selling retail to the public for probably, I don't even know, since I could remember. So I, quite a long time. We've always ever sold what we had. If we had it in stock, we'd sell it to the public. Why not? Um, but we've recently started wholesaling on a limited limited bit like regional wholesaling right so we're not we're not shipping wire across the country or anything yet maybe i don't know but um yeah that's been picking up it really has we've been selling fence fittings online shameless plug ozfence.store uh, you can check out all of our uh, all of our fencing related stuff that we can ship to you which is going to be your chain link fittings your vinyl coated steel fittings all sorts of that sort of stuff. That's been picking up lately, which indicates to me that fencing is ramping up. So we're also selling a little bit of Hunt Amazon of all places. Go figure. 
uh, we've been actually selling a lot. So we were chatting this morning. So, so far, let's check. Great content here for you guys. So we've had, just today, we've had eight sales on Amazon. So we're going to be doing that later. Just boxing up stuff to send all over the country. But I digress. Business is picking up, guys. I hope business is picking up in your neck of the woods. I know uh, I, I see I see Stain Man in the comments. Uh, so hopefully staining season will start picking up in a little bit. So here it's been it's been really windy. So earlier earlier in the week, I don't know what was that Tuesday, Wednesday, it was like tw gusting to twenty five miles an hour or something. So not ideal stain weather. And then when it wasn't windy, it was raining. Almost stain season. Almost at least here in Southwest Missouri. Almost next week, sixties to seventies. Gonna rain a little bit, but. Anyway, that's your weather update, I guess. Craig wants to know, what is the best way to attach wood fence to round metal posts? It is a wood-to-steel adapter. Um, chainless plug, we sell them. Um, but so what we sell, so there is a Simpson bracket. Uh, oh, man, was it PGT2? PGR2? I don't know. Simpson makes a bracket specifically for this. We sell a version of that bracket. It is not the Simpson bracket. It is the nationwide version of that bracket. but it it's a one piece bracket. There's there's a, there's several brackets out there in the market. The one we use is the one piece bracket. Uh, there's a two piece bracket. I see you use a lot in the Southwest for some reason, like the Texas and the Southern California. A lot of round steel posts down there, totally fine. But they use these two piece brackets. Those things scare me. I mean, there's more points of failure there than in the one piece. And if there's anything that we're trying to do is reduce callbacks, which is reduce points of failure. Uh, so one piece, the one piece wood to steel adapter, check it out. OZFence.store. Check out the, uh, wood hardware, wood gate hardware collection, I believe is where it is, but yeah, we like them. We like them. We use them. So we ordered a bunch of them. We ordered 3,500 or 4,000 of them, something like that. But, um, why not sell them to you guys too, or to everyone, you know? So yeah. Morning, Joe and Fence fam. Greetings from Texas. I'm I'm also jealous of you folks in Texas, where I'm sure the weather is nice. It's always warm in Texas, especially in the summer. It gets really warm in Texas. But morning, Kenny. Hey, Kenny, I'm glad to see you. Not like try to introduce yourself as one of these uh, one of these one of your personas, so to speak. So, what do you always say? You always say you're like a uh, swimsuit model or something. But Kenny's good to see you. All right, so things are shaping up. Like I said, uh, business is picking up. The season's starting. I think everyone's getting supplied and getting ready for season. Uh, unfortunately, we've been seeing price increases. What was it two weeks ago? We saw a price increase again from one of the national uh, manufacturer wholesalers. So, um, yep, just as everybody's gearing up, which is kind of odd. Usually, you don't see price increases through the winter. But if there's anything we've learned in the last year and a half, two years, it's you absolutely throw the playbook out the window because – there's nothing that makes sense lately. Michael Taylor's here. Bam, bam. Morning. Tennessee's cold here this morning. I I feel you. I feel you. It was a balmy, I think, 29, 28 degrees this morning when I rolled out of the house. A little bit chilly here in the Midwest. So things are picking up, though, right? So we're starting to get a lot of phone calls. We're already six to eight weeks out, which is more than what we want, right? So we're adjusting our production pricing accordingly just to try to keep that in that four to six week range um as i've talked about before every contractor sweet spot is going to be different right so our sweet spot is at four to six weeks that's where we like to stay anything more and we start we have to over communicate that they're still on the schedule here's where you are in the schedule we haven't run off with your deposit we promise Right. So that four to six weeks keeps us in that sweet spot. So now we're having to over communicate because we're in the six to eight. We just are pricing, right? To try to bring it back into that sweet spot of four to six weeks. Uh, so 10% price increase is typically what we do to see uh, how the market receives that. Here's my opinion is no matter what your sweet spot is, ours is four to six. Yours could be six to eight or eight to 10, whatever your sweet spot is. But when I start seeing our schedule be consistently outside that more than our sweet spot, it's an indication to me that the market is telling us that we're underpriced for the value that we're providing. Right. So rather than, rather than just let it run off, we would raise the prices to try to one, bring our value 
more in line with where the market places us in the value spectrum, uh, but also try to keep our schedule in check. Uh, I, now, I know there's other ways of thinking about this, right? I mean, you, you've got guys that are already booked out halfway through summer, and I understand. That probably feels really good to have that much work on the books. I couldn't imagine the pricing conundrums you get into being that far out. Unless, you know, I mean, the the way you combat that is you buy your materials when the job sells, but then you're also wrapping up that material for however many months you're booked out, just sitting on the lot, taking up space and tying up your cash flow. So I don't know, to each their own. But here our sweet spot is four to six weeks. Now, that being said, we have a tremendous amount of stock because, like I said, we're pushing into the regional wholesale route. So we're sitting on between six and $750,000 worth of inventory here where we can kind of set our prices to a certain extent. We know, not set our prices, but our prices are set for the near term if it's something we have in stock. If it's, you know, if it's standard height chain length, four, six, eight foot, or if it's uh, wood, we've got quite a lot of pickets. We've got, luckily, we've got several thousand of the Postmasters in stock before their latest price increase. Um, but that's that's how we combat. But still, even though we've got all that inventory on the lot, we still don't like to go past four or six weeks out. It just makes me nervous trying to hold on to somebody's, somebody's deposit for that long because in the state of Missouri, we're allowed to take a 50% deposit. And we do. It, it That way, both us and the client have a little bit of skin in the game when it comes to building this fence. So, yep, yeah, anyway. Four to six, we currently we're 60 to eight weeks out. Let me know where you guys are at uh, schedule-wise. I don't need to know specifically. I'm just trying to get a gauge for, you know, is the Midwest alone in this? I have a feeling not. I've talked to a few fence guys that are telling me, even through the winter time, they were past their ideal schedule. Uh, but let me know where you guys are and where you guys are in your scheduling. Joe Rivers says it's 65 and sunny. Here's setting post. Joe, I am absolutely jealous of you and your fantastic weather. Next week is, like I said, 60s and 70s, but it's going to be rainy. So, Since when did this turn into a weather? Is this a lot? Hey, here's a question for you. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a, a state of conversation a lot when I'm talking about. So I had, um, so Randy Ward, if you guys know Randy, Randy was through, hey, it was that. That was Wednesday, maybe? Wednesday, Thursday, Randy came through and when um, talking. So Randy's with Benford Supply now. And so we're talking about what Benford has to offer and how Benford can work with Ozark Fence to better, you know, provide for our clients. Uh, but one thing Randy, Randy and I were talking about, he's like, is it a podcast or is it a is it a vlog or what it, what do you call what you do on YouTube and Facebook? I said, Randy, that's a pretty solid question, and I don't have an answer for it. I call this a live, a live stream. I think that's a pretty understood uh terminology for what we're doing right now but like what do we call the recorded content i don't know a youtube show i guess but what do we call it when it's replayed on facebook i don't know or now on odyssey right so as i shared with you guys last week all of the content that we push out onto youtube is now being simultaneously also shared on odyssey because we had some team not some team members but we had some of you guys our viewers uh, that had expressed concerns about um, maybe some data privacy issues going on over there, and they just didn't feel comfortable being directed towards that platform. So now we're on Odyssey, which it, you'll see as we're sharing content onto Facebook, we're typically sharing it from Odyssey because I think I think these people are probably, I think they're onto something when we're talking about data privacy and, and who owns whose data and how is that data used. Um, so Odyssey is a decentralized platform that, Anyway, that's a whole conversation. I don't know what you call the YouTube stuff, the recorded stuff we do. I don't know. We're going to have to figure this out because some people call them, call them podcasts, but it's podcasts to me, and I think Dan would agree. Dan Wheeler, we talked to him a, a little bit ago. Uh, podcast is typically audio only, but now there's some podcasts on YouTube, which is audio only, which kind of scrambles my brain because YouTube, as I understand it, is all about video content, interacting with you guys in a video way, right? So it's not a podcast because podcast is audio only, and this obviously includes video, but it's not like a vlog, a, a video blog, right? So that's, well, I don't know. 
vlog to me feels more like kind of what we're transitioning the content to in the near future would be like a week in the week in the life right? or we can review day in the life that sort of concept where uh, we just kind of behind the scenes look at ozark fence and what my day kind of looks like sort of thing that feels like a vlog but i don't know anyway this is this is the conundrum that my mind goes through and the rabbit holes i go through thinking about this nonsense all right roger we almost sent sent a search party out for you because i was like we are how how far into this we are 20 minutes into this and we haven't heard from roger is he okay does anyone know does anyone know roger should we send somebody to look for him but no call off the search party roger's here hey fence fam almost missed it roger we're so glad you didn't miss it and as always roger does a fantastic job of reminding you guys don't forget to hit the thumbs up no matter where you're watching this whether it's on youtube or facebook or linkedin there is a version of that was backwards the thumbs up right and they can be called like or it can be called whatever press that thing because that lets that platform know that we're providing content that you guys enjoy seeing and it helps share it with other people totally free how about that also i wouldn't be doing my job if i didn't ask you guys to also subscribe to the channel so that you can find more of our content in the future and when you do subscribe on youtube hit the notification bell that's the important part there was an article i was reading i don't know it's been a few weeks ago uh talking about the how the organic reach of youtube is going down significantly because there's so many channels and so much content out there that it's hard for the youtube algorithm to figure out exactly what everyone wants to see all the time but if you are subscribed and you hit the notification bell that's a clear indicator to the algorithm that you want to see more of our content and therefore you shall see more of it theoretically that's how they say it works so i don't know guys i'm a fence guy that tries to do technology but that is my understanding of how that works if you'd like to see this stuff subscribe hit the notification bell roger thank you for getting that little thing going into my head appreciate it so brayden is actually on the other side of this screen right now he's our newest team member here at ozark fence but specifically on the youtube channel so if you guys have been to any of the fence tech or anywhere and you've met jeremy jeremy is kind of our business manager producer he was our videographer and editor to a certain extent now Braden has entered the equation to become the newest videographer and editor on the team so you guys will be meeting him shortly but he says live video podcast live video okay okay but Brent, what do you think what do we call the recorded content though vod this is why Braden's here folks we're calling it a vod video on demand and i've been informed this is a legitimate term for what this is i think we found it i think we found what these things are called they're VODs and it has that like cool sound to it, right? It's a VOD. All right. And this would be a live video podcast. Okay. I got to remember these things. I probably need to write them down like on this. So what you guys are watching me through, it's a camera, but it's also a um, projector screen that it projects it. I need to write it on here so that I know we are to refer to recorded content as VODs and the live is now to be referred to as a live video podcast. And now we all just got a little bit smarter. Roger says, let's just go towards expert cast. Roger, I like the way your brain's working. Let's just go towards an expert cast. Maybe that's what we call this, the expert cast. Me and Roger Wakefield would like that. So Roger's actually the one that got me into YouTube. If you guys have watched the channel, you've heard me talk about Roger Wakefield. Huge impact on obviously making this happen. He basically strong-armed me to start a YouTube channel. Um, and that's where the expert thing came from because he is the expert plumber, Roger Wakefield, the expert plumber, which I think now his, his channels just transitioned towards Roger Wakefield. But when I first was introduced to him, he was a plumbing expert or the expert plumber. So I like this, the expert cast, let's just go towards the expert cast. You got it. Josh Rand. What is up? Hello, buddy. How are you? The weather is I'm sure better out there for sure. If you guys watch. If you guys are on any of the fencing Facebook groups anywhere on any of the platforms, 
you know Josh. He's really good at producing uh, YouTube, or not YouTube, but Facebook content on exactly what is going on at Aloha Fence in Utah. Very good to see you. Uh, all right, Bam Bam has, has thrown his vote in for expert cast as well. I think we're voting on this now. I think that's what we're doing. Uh, Michael Taylor says, think you could find a sponsor for that. I think so. I think so. But we're already, listen, Bam Bam, you guys already sponsored the live. Like, we're already there with you guys. Like, stay and seal experts or experts stay and seal. Now, it depends on what you're talking. Are we talking about the brand or the product? The brand stainless steel experts is one of our very first sponsors. They sponsor the whole stinking live show. Uh, and actually, we're getting a new banner with the new branding on it, the expert stainless steel branding. So now here's what I got to figure out. I got to figure out how to get more of these hats made. So, bam, bam, you seem to be the guy with the pull around there. So, need more. We need more. I say we. I need more of these hats because like the nice orange lettering and all that I've been told it's not possible, but I know you and everything is possible. So I'm just going to ask you to work on that for me. A few more of these hats. I don't want to wash it. So that's the thing is like, I know there's no more coming, right? So I don't want to wash it. I don't want to clean it. My wife is on it. Taylor wants this hat washed and I don't because I'm, nightmare scenario for me is this thing gets thrown in the washer or some people put them in the dishwasher i'm not sure about that but you put in the what happens when it gets messed up and it comes out not good anymore and i can't get any more of them this is the dilemma i need more hats like this one because this one has the orange lettering that is what is important about this hat is the orange lettering it needs to go with the theme so josh josh says yes sir is that how that was pronounced? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, there we go. Dan says, the first and only expert cast. Yeah, I like the way your mind works. I really do. The first and only expert. Well, but see, then Roger Wakefield would come hit me. He's got this really big plumbing wrench that he does videos with sometimes. This thing is massive. Like, it's, it's like three or four foot long. This thing is huge. He would come hit me with that if I said first and only expert. Because I think he would feel insulted that he is also an expert in his field and his channel is revolved around being an expert in the field. I don't want Roger to hit me with hard things. So, but what if we said one of the only expert casts? But see, yours would be so Dan Wheeler runs obviously the Fence Industry Podcast, says it right there in his title. So you're also running a, a version of the expert cast, the expert podcast, right? Expert cast implies podcast, I think. And also live. Oh, all right. Let me go back up here. Remind me what we're talking. Live video podcast. So I don't know. Maybe not the first and only. We want to be all inclusive here, right? We've got other guys doing content. Other fence guys doing really good content. We're not looking to exclude anyone. Listen, this is something I catch heat on sometimes about the name of this channel. The Fence Expert. So the the when I not he, but I catch a good ribbing for it sometimes talking about oh the fence expert. So you're you're the one. You're the fence expert. I didn't and my point is I don't say the only fence expert or the first fence expert or the best fence expert. I'm just the fence expert, right? Like that's a that's a self-proclaimed title, I guess. But um anyway, I Expert cast, I like this. The first and only, we're trying to be inclusive here, Dan. We really are. I like the idea, though. All right, Bam Bam says, never say never on the hat. Now, listen, here's an idea I was having, and I need to talk to Kayla about this. So, I need to talk to Kayla. I'm thinking you could probably have some of these custom made. And so, well, that's what I'm thinking, is I go to one of these custom hat places. They're, they, we've got them in town. They're the ones that do the custom branding for businesses and stuff. And I say, I need like five of these, right? Maybe six of them. Maybe, bam, I get, get one smuggled over to you. I Smuggled, I can ship it. We got shipping places and stuff here now. I ship you one too, but I don't know. And we'll call them throwback. We'll call them retro, right? Like that's a cool term now, retro. Joe Rivers wants to know, Joe's right. We need to get back onto some fencing content here. Joe, I'm sorry, fellow Joe. 
what's your take on sub crews versus hourly employees? All right. We use both at Ozark fence. We use both. Um, we actually, so I think Ken and I talked a little bit about this last week, um, but you, it's, you need to figure out what the right tool is for the right job. Right. So typically, typically the kind of the, where that split is between hourly and subcontract is typically in the residential versus commercial space. Um, residential really wants to know exactly when you're going to be there, how long you're going to be there, how long the process is going to take that sort of thing. And with true subcontractors, they, they give the company they're working for their schedule. Uh, now they're supposed to, right? So a true subcontractor sets their own schedule, provides their own tools, trucks, etc., and sets their pay wage or their not pay wage, but their pay rate. So they tell the company what they will build this fence for. Now, whether they give that price on a per foot or per project basis, I think that's a gray area. But the point is, from a company standpoint, we can't set the schedule. We can't say, hey, this job starts on this day. We also can't say this job pays this much sort of thing. So on residential, that's a little tricky. So we use in-house, we use in-house team members for residential because residential, we do have more control over when they're going to be there. You know, especially when we're scheduling six to eight weeks out, it's not great to tell them that we're going to be there in about six to eight weeks, right? We need to give them at least a week, an idea of which week we're going to be there in six to eight weeks. However, on the commercial, they're a little less picky. They want to know, can it be done by my deadline? Can it stay in, in budget? And will it meet the specifications I give you? right? Are you going to keep me out of trouble? And keep me out of trouble means I'm not going to get talked to from my boss about it coming in late, about it being over budget, or about it not being what we told them we wanted. So they really don't have as much, they really don't have as much uh, concern over, do these employees work directly for you? Or are they subcontractors, independent contractors working through you? That sort of thing. Commercial just wants it done. They want it done. They want it done right. And they give you a deadline. So it's a little bit of using the right tool for the right job. Now, I know some guys out there that only use in-house team members. And I know some companies that only use some subcontract labor. So it can go either way. I'm not saying what we do is right. What I'm saying is it's just the way that we happen to do it is to use both. The right tool for the right job. We use in-house team members for residential projects and commercial subcontract crews, independent crews for the commercial work. I hope that helps. That is my take. That's how we do it. I did say move towards. Okay, so what? All right, let's just, let's just go towards an expert cast. Okay, okay. So Roger did say that when he was saying, he, he did, I will remind everybody, he said, let's just go towards an expert cast. All right, so. Roger wants to be clear. He wasn't, listen, he's not with Dan and saying the first and only, okay? Dan, he's kind of laying you out by yourself on this one. He's rolling you under that bus. But expert cast, I don't know. That does sound kind of fun, right? Um, But I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But guys, let me know how things are going on your end um, as far as scheduling and all that. What are you guys seeing as far as, I think this could be an interesting subject to get into is, uh, what, what types of fence are you getting calls for the most right now? Uh, we used to get, we used to get a lot of call for wood fence. We used to have one crew that only did wood fence. They were our wood crew. Um, now it's a little bit of a mix, right? So we're getting, we're still doing wood, but with the price of lumber and now steel with the postmaster post, it's a little bit of price prohibitive. Um, especially when our six foot cedar privacy on steel post is competitively priced with ornamental steel with lifetime warranty, right? So now that's kind of an interesting concept too. Uh, and it used to be chain link was the economy version. So if you needed a fence and you really didn't care what it looked like, but you're wanting to save the most amount of money, chain link was pretty much where you sat at. Uh, but with steel increases, these are kind of all in a similar ballpark, especially when you get into vinyl coated chain link. So uh, we're getting calls for a little bit of everything. Uh, aluminum last year was really strong for us for aluminum. We got a lot of calls for aluminum last year. Um, did a bunch of chain link. <coughs> so
So if you look out on our lot, you would see we've got a ton of chain link just stacked up ready to go because that's what we did a lot of last year. Let me know what you guys are seeing on your end at your part of the country. Oh, excuse me. I don't even know why I'm yawning. I was up before my alarm this morning. Fence me in says, do you have a pound crew and a finish crew? How do you schedule those installs? We don't. We have. Uh, so when I was working for uh, my granddad and then my dad, we had set crews and finish crews. Uh, so we don't. So in our in our part of the country, we don't drive. We can't drive. It's so rocky that we just can't drive the fence post. Now I understand if we used a heavy, really heavy post and one of those Evo drivers, maybe we could get through it. But for ninety percent of what we're doing, driving's not an option. So we had set crews and finish crews. The problem is there's a lack of cohesive understanding on that project. Right, so you can explain it in depth to the set crew. You can walk the job. You can explain everything to them. Sometimes changes are made when you're in the middle of a set. You guys that build fence know how this goes. When you're in the middle of the project, sometimes things changes. Things change. Sometimes you, I don't know, you hit a massive root and the thing has to move. And now all of a sudden you've gone from X amount of eight foot sections to now you've got eight and ten foot sections, right? Because you had to move. Well, and so it wouldn't be it. You've had a six foot and ten foot section. Um, but maybe that gets relayed and maybe that doesn't to the finish crew. So the finish crew comes out, they don't have the right materials. They were set up for X amount of eight foot only. Now they need some sixes, which is, you can always cut eight foot down. You can't stretch them out to 10, at least not yet. I haven't seen a tool yet. They'll stretch an eight foot two before to a 10 foot two before, but, um, and then if there were callbacks, you would get a fair amount of finger pointing from one crew to the other. Uh, that that wasn't a finished crew item. That was a set crew item. The set crew should have to go fix that. Uh, it, I don't know. A lot of finger pointing. So we have each crew has their project start to finish. That way they can own the job. So Sean King, if you guys follow fencing, you follow Sean. He talks about owning your hole. Like this is your hole. You own it. Make sure it's exactly right. Same process for each crew only having one job is they own that job. If there's a callback on that job, it's their callback on the job, right? And they know they know that, hey, that's right. When we were setting that job, we had to move a post over. So now we do need to make sure we've got three 10-foot two-by-fours. Uh, we're probably going to have extra eight-foot sort of thing. So anyway, we don't. So there is a there is a company here in town that still does the set crew, finish crew, and when we when we onboard team members here that have come from that, um, that's kind of a that still seems like a common pain point with that s situation is uh, finger pointing and just and you have to walk through the job twice, right? So whoever's doing project management walks through this project with two different crews instead of one crew. So that's the way it works for us. Again, it worked. Some people use set crews and and finish crews really effectively from a scheduling standpoint. The, com the company that does it here in town that does set and finish, they're really large. So they'll say this set crew is just going to set to this week and then the finish crew. So whatever jobs they set on Monday, on this Monday, the finish crew would come through and nail next Monday sort of thing. Now, it always takes longer to set than to finish typically. So the finish crews all also have a little bit easier week because they follow the set crew schedule just a week off a week delayed so anyway um but yeah so us having one crew per job also helps us schedule it we know how many sections per week that crew can realistically accomplish um, and we add some wiggle room because rocky jobs are different than easy digging jobs right and we also allow if so what we do is we allow a flex day on wednesday where we don't have any production scheduled to try to account for weather too. Like we we're talking about this time of year, we can get a lot of weather and it's not uncommon in the summertime to have weather also. I mean, in the summertime, in the heat of the summer, we're also accounting for, you know, water breaks and shade breaks too, to try to keep guys nice and healthy. So we set on Mondays and Tuesdays, finish on Thursdays and Fridays with Wednesday as a flex day. So if we see it's going to rain Tuesday, now we bump that Tuesday set over to Wednesday. Just the same, if we see it's supposed to rain Thursday, we'll bump that Thursday's nail project up to Wednesday. Try to help keep things on schedule. And it works It works pretty well. Now, there's not – sometimes we get off. 
So next week's going to have three or four days of rain in it. That's going to monkey everything up in the schedule if we actually get it. Now, here's the thing in southwest Missouri. We sit up, up on a plateau. So a lot of times the weather they say we're going to get, that the models say we're going to get, we don't actually end up getting. So anyway, hope that made sense. Let me know what you guys do. You guys do set crews and finish crews or all one crew, you know, completes the project. I'm perfectly fine learning a thing or two on the set and finish crews. Josh says they're seeing mostly vinyl finch right now, but we do most all of it. I tell you what, up there, Josh, I've seen, well, so Sean's video, uh, up there in Utah, you guys handle some crazy amounts of vinyl. I mean, at least what he was showing us was just, you guys are a massive vinyl market for sure. I mean, it's, it's not even close. Uh, at least here on our market, so vinyl vinyl is a thing. We have a couple uh, competitors here that only, well, not only do vinyl. They used to, just like we used to only do, we had one crew only did wood. Uh, these whole companies only did vinyl. Now they're branching out into other things just because of the price of vinyl. But as a market, as a whole, we're not so much a uh, vinyl market. You guys, on the other hand, Utah seems to be very much a vinyl market. Uh, Joe River says they're doing vinyl and chain link. Good to know. So typically vinyl guys. So so guys, talk to me about this. If you guys are doing vinyl, do you also do wood, or do you vine, do you do vinyl in the place of wood? Uh, it seems like the guys here that do vinyl won't do wood. They you know vinyl is the upgraded version of wood in their opinion. Um, so it's curious to me if you guys do. So Joe, you say you do vinyl and chain link. Do you guys now also like? Obviously, climate comes into play, too. You guys are going to be a lot more humid down there, too, which probably affects the longevity of wood, right? So, interesting. Joe says, we also, we, we're also a subcontractor for an, electrical, for an electric security fence or for electric security fence. Interesting. So, electric security fence, are we talking about, like, mon like chain link that's monitored? Uh, so, there's, a, there's an outfit here, an automation company that will – through magic as far as i i can figure out uh they can hook some they can hook they can hook things up to the chain link fence they know whether it's cut now it, it's not electric though it's not electrified though because that's got its own liability you know ba bag of worms box of worms can of worms um explain joe explain to me a little bit more about this electric security fence i'd like to learn Map want, Map bot wants to know what is the asking for? Like, what do we ask about? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the question was. Maybe, maybe clarify that a little bit. Vince Man, good points. Thank you. That's how it works for us, right? So we've we've been doing this since 1955. We've had a little bit of, you know, longevity to try to figure out what works for us. But that doesn't mean that that doesn't work for somebody else. That is the overarching point of this show: is that. To try to teach everyone that just because it works for us doesn't mean it'll work for you, but maybe you pick up a thing or two. That even rhymed. So that might be that might be a thing on the show from now on. Bam Bam says, I like that flex tape. Man, I tell you what. So it 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 can on paper, it looks like it's cutting down on the production, right? I mean, you're taking a day out of production. So it's it seems like it would cause less production to get uh done but when you account for weather when you account for any sort of delays you know like on the standing side you get there and the neighbors haven't been notified and one of them doesn't want you on on the site that day or, or whatever or it rains or it's windy sort of thing like wind comes into account on staining flex days make sense they really really do but like i said if you're tracking production per day at first, it doesn't make sense until you figure out you're not actually making that production. When you look in, when you look behind, when you look in arrears the last six months, you realize, you know, if you're planning our production every day, that's not necessarily uh, realistic. Craig Yarmula Senior, I butchered that. Craig, I'm sorry. Yarmula, Yarmula Senior. Ah. Craig, are there any woods that you can't use with, are there any woods that you can't use with pressure treated wood? No, I mean, so like pressure treated, um, like pressure treated post with another type of wood as like a stringer and picket, maybe. Um, we used to offer that with like a, a treated pine, 
post with cedar two by fours and pickets sort of thing. I don't know. No, I don't know of any wood that doesn't react well with pressure treated wood. Um, I don't know. Do you got you guys watching at home? Do you have any? Are there any woods that you can't use with pressure treated wood? Not that I know of. I mean, but here in the Midwest, we primarily deal with pressure treated pine, cedar, and a wide variety of cedars. Whether we're talking about red cedar, whether we're talking about white cedar, we're talking about incense cedar. Typically, pine and cedar. Uh, we don't deal in any redwood or ipe or anything really crazy that you West Coast guys uh, have access to that I am incredibly jealous about um no douglas fir or anything like that so i don't know in my experience the answer is no uh there aren't any woods that you cannot use in conjunction with pressure treated wood josh says i charge more for wood it takes longer and pushes people to the vinyl easy button for both parties win-win interesting that's very interesting to hear um yeah okay so the the production it takes wood takes longer so I would have to think you have the same set time, or at least similar set time, right? You're still digging the holes. You're still, I'm not here to talk about wet set versus dry set concrete, but you're still setting it. Um, unless, so Josh, are you driving? So that's an interesting thought. Uh, so I saw, who did I say? I saw Sean again, um, driving steel posts and using those donuts uh, with the vinyl. That's incredibly interesting. That's an interesting thought. Makes replacement probably a breeze. Um, so probably it's in the assembly, right? So uh, in the in the just construction of two befores and pickets, uh, I could probably see that. And you're not, it's probably less equipment on site. So you're not worrying about the generator or not generator, the air compressor, air hose, nail guns, any sort, more points of failure there, I would think. Interesting. Joe says separate system that's solar power, seven to 10,000 volts. So you're telling me the actual fence is electrified that that's wild like from a liability standpoint that would be that would seem pretty crazy but you never know all right it's obviously a thing how about cab overs versus truck how are the cab overs versus the trucks going we love the cab over so we've got an isuzu npr that we absolutely love i mean it's it's not even close. I really think like we are having a very real conversation about uh, because our our flatbed one ton dually is get, it's getting up there in years now. It's still running, so in this you know in this automotive market, we will run this thing till the wheels fall off. But uh, I I think we like it we like it less than the cab over. I mean, the cab over has a eighteen foot bed or sixteen foot bed bolted on the back of it right? We don't even have to take a trailer similar to the concept. I, I reference Sean a lot on the show, but Sean's got these monster trucks, not monster trucks, but massive trucks, um, that have massive beds on same concept, smaller version, but you don't have to, you don't have to drive a trailer or you don't have to pull a trailer behind it. Um, so there's probably some driving safety, uh, benefits to having the cab over. They're just easier to drive. They really are. And what we're finding is they're also easier to maintain. So we're a big fan of the cab over truck, specifically the, the Isuzu, N, Isuzu NPR. I mean, knock on wood, haven't had anything crazy go wrong with that thing. We've done some routine maintenance on it, but that's about it. Um, and when we do do routine maintenance on it, pretty straightforward, pretty easy. So we like cab overs. Also, let me know what you guys think. It would be great if this was an interactive show where you could just talk with me. I think that's coming in Metaverse. That's a whole conversation. We talked about Metaverse uh, two or three weeks ago after coming back from social media marketing world one day, I don't know when, but one day I think this will, whole thing will be virtual where we'll all be hanging out in the same like room. We can see each other. We can talk to each other. There's a thing it's haptics where I put on a glove, you put on a glove and we can shake hands from across the world, anywhere with an internet connection. That's crazy, but it's coming. Uh, anyway, that's, yeah, that's coming. So that's my answer on cab overs, reverse trucks, cab overs for the win. Uh, Fence Me In says, thank you so much. You're very welcome. We currently do not have separate crews, but have been thinking about it. Your points are something to take into consideration. I, I would. I would really, really think long and hard about that. Now, I understand, like, the benefits are you've got one crew that's totally decked out for that job, right, or for that task. 
with just setting posts. And you have another truck and another crew that's totally set up for finishing, nailing, stretching, you know, depending on whether you're doing wood or chain link or, or vinyl or what have you. You can have that like a purpose built truck and a purpose built crew. Definitely seems enticing, but I don't. I mean, we have the ability to, we could do that both in equipment and personnel. I, I don't see us going back to that just because of it. It was, it seemed like it was always a headache. It really did. Now, like I said, there's companies, there's one here in town that do it and do it well. So, but the employees that we onboard from there, they don't like it either. So just because there's no, there's no, uh, consistent responsibility on who's responsible for what sort of. And from the client's perspective too, think about that, that, you know, once one crew's there, the crew leader introduces themselves to the client. I'm the guy that's going to be building your fence. You know, if you have any questions, let me know rather than now they've got two crew leaders like, well, so wait a minute, I thought I met Scott. Now I'm meeting Jason or whomever. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like keeping one crew to one job, a lot cleaner. Uh, Josh says, yes, same time to set posts. Uh, drilling holes, dry pack and dry set. We use them in the excavator. Yeah. So, um, so interesting. So yeah, so same time to set the post. So the, the time must be the time savings for vinyl over wood must be in the construction. Um, which, which makes sense. You're not, which makes sense. Um, we're not getting into wet set versus dry set, but, uh, we also do use a mini excavator. We use the Bobcat MT 100. Um, seems to be a good little platform. We like it a lot. We came, we upgraded from a dingo, one of the smaller dingoes, um, that Bobcat MT-100 seems to really do the job. When we, If and when we can find more of them, we'll likely be buying them. But it's like, I think it's like a six or eight month lead time now on those things. With this one, we got lucky. There was someone that had ordered one, special ordered one. At the time they ordered it, they, could, they pre-qualified for financing, but then it got in and they went to go through normal financing and then they... <laughs> In the meantime, they'd gone like bought and bought a truck and bought some other stuff. So now they couldn't acquire financing for the for the excavator. So we we're able to pick it up uh, like the week after we called in. I called in just to be put on the put on a wait list. So you know this dingo, it, it's getting to the point we're probably within a year of replacing this thing. Let's get on your list. I know it's incredibly long. Uh, and the and the dealer said actually a dealer rep said actually um, what do you tell me exactly what you need? And I did. And he said I've I've got one that that checks like nine out of 10 of those boxes sitting here. This, this person didn't qualify for not financing yesterday. So now my boss told me we got to put it out on the open market. You're the first person that's called in about it. If you want it. And he said, if you can qualify for financing, I said, no, no, we'll, we'll bring you a check for it. No financing. I'll just buy it. And it, it took him a little bit to, um, they had to put the weight kit on it and, it didn't come with a bucket or something, or it didn't come with forks, I think. So we had to wait for forks to get in about a week. But anyway, Mini X for the win. I like that. And the MT100, I like it a lot. I understand a lot of guys use uh, the Vermeer platform. Uh, I think that's a capable platform platform as well. I just didn't feel we demoed a Vermeer. Ah, it's been years ago. So I could be operating on old uh, experience here as well. But it was really, um, really twitchy, I guess is the only word I would use for it. Like it. A little move of that joystick really sends you running in that direction. Uh, if I were using it day in, day out, I think it'd be fine. But in terms of putting team members on it that, you know, different team members on different days or whatnot, I'd, I wouldn't feel good about that. So anyway, Bobcat MT100 is where we ended up. It's behind the chain linker fence with lots of warnings. Okay, so the electrified, okay, so the electric wire is behind the chain link with lots of signs. Got it. I was just sitting here thinking, I was like, man, how crazy is that? Like from a liability standpoint. Okay. So behind a fence with lots of warning signs, I guess, reduces the liability. Good to know. Yep. Own your hole, own your job, stealing that and making a shirt. Uh-oh. Well, uh, listen, you're asking for trouble, Josh. I don't know. That whole own your hole. I think own your hole is already on a shirt. I think Sean's already got that one on a shirt. So I don't know. it might be trademarked. I don't know. Copyrighted or whatever. Uh, whatever that is. So yeah, you got to own your job. So that that's the benefit of having one crew on one job is they own the job. Uh, and Corso wants to know, how do you get the top of post level on unleveled dirt? So we typically, we typically run a string line. I know some people out there are cursing string lines. 
I get it. However, uh, we typically use a longer post. So we'd set to full depth, leave the posts tall, run a string line across the top of them. So at first we would do a true measurement on the job and then we would feather it up or down depending on where we need to be to try to get that top of the fence level. Um, using longer posts and leaving them high is how is how we try to accomplish it on unlevel dirt. Great question. Oh, you also answered the question. Run a string line across the top. That, that's how we visualize it. It really is. Uh, we can we set it all to height, and then we, we set the string line to height. We can take a step back, look at it, and realize, okay, I'm visualizing this top line. This needs to come up. This needs to, well, this needs to come up. This needs to come down. Whatever this, whatever it is, the use case on that is. Um, yeah, string line helps you visualize it. It really does. Stoner for life. I love it. Says my fence is blackberries, vines, and box thorns. Sounds incredibly effective. Uh, yeah, green fences are really are really phenomenal, and they aren't regulated as fences, right? So, uh, in our town, in the town I live in, uh, which is outside of Springfield, we're limited to six foot. Now, in Springfield, we're still somewhat limited to six foot. They'll let you do a seven or eight foot, but you have to have engineers stamp drawings and special inspections They make it hard enough to where you don't want to have an eight foot fence, but in Republic, you just can't do it. Like it is six foot or it's nothing. Um, however, so we have a six foot, but the problem is the houses behind us are two story houses. Well, what does a six foot, six foot fence do for that? Not a single thing. Right. So I was talking to a landscaper buddy of mine. He said, you know what we ought to do? He said, cause I was kind of griping about that. I was like, I don't want to be on. So Typically in the evenings after the kids go to bed, the wife's in the bath, I go out on the back porch and have a cigar and watch YouTube videos and Facebook videos, get caught up on the fencing industry. Uh, I like, I don't really want someone just being able to look into my yard and see me hanging out on the porch. I mean, not that I'm, like I'm sitting there having cigars, it's not like, you know, in a hot tub or something, but I just don't like the lack of privacy. Right. And so he had suggested, and we installed, uh, where they call their, uh, it's a, it's an evergreen tree called a green giant. These things are massive. Like we've had, let's see, we've been in this house for five years. So these things have been planted for probably four years. They're every bit of 20 foot tall, Like they are massive. And now, so their 20 foot is somewhere around the height limit of these 20 to 30 feet. Once they hit the height limit, they start growing out. Now all of a sudden we've got a big green fence that is not regulated as a fence. There are no regulations on how tall your trees can be. So, Anyway, blackberries, vine, blackberry vines, and box thorns sounds like an incredibly effective green barrier. Roger, like to know what is the cost comparison of the MT100 to the Little Beaver? Oh, MT100 is a lot. There's a lot more. So I think mm, I'd have to go see, but it's north of fifty thousand dollars. I'd have to go see exactly what we paid for it. But it's like I said, I think with accessories, it's a diesel platform, wide track. It's it's north of it's more than fifty thousand. Uh, and little beaver, I think, is significantly less than that. So, it is it is a lot more, um, but it it also performs a lot more duties for us. So, it really takes the spot of one like a one crew member. So, a three man crew or three person crew with the MT hundred is now a four person crew, right? In terms of carrying capacity, in terms of showing up every day, that sort of thing, it's always there, always running. And course, I want to know, do we use a string line level? So not when we're setting the top of it. Uh, so we'll really just use eye, we'll use our eye on the flow of the top line. Uh, so like I said, we'll start by measuring we'll, the exact height and we'll set. So if we're doing chain link, we'll use little magnets to set the top height of that string line. Um, or if it's, if it's a wood fence, we'll wrap the post, you know, whatever. Um, but no, so we don't use a line level when we're setting the top line. Uh, usually we'll do that by eye. Yeah. Yeah. String line level, little guys hang on top. Uh, we don't just because, so your eye, your eye is going to look for flow versus level. I mean, your level is one of the things your eye does look for, but it like there's, there's, you know, the, the importance varies, right? So it's not the top of the list at B level. It wants it to look, it wants it, your eye wants it to look like it flows well, right? Not necessarily that it's level. 
Because if your ground's not level, but your fence top is, your eye's going to think there's a problem with that. Your eye's going to see the slope of your yard, but then your fence stays perfectly flat, and your eye's going to—it's going to bug you. So no, we don't use uh, line levels on the top to set the top line of fence. My fence life says, Joe, where's the cool orange cap you've been wearing? It's downstairs. I wore this one because all the lives are sponsored by Stain and Seal Experts. Shout out to Stain and Seal Experts. Expert Stain and Seal is a product they carry. For more information about Stain and Seal Experts, check out the description below. No matter where you're watching, I've got it actually. So it's the description below on YouTube, on Facebook, and LinkedIn. It's the first comment underneath. Uh, but that's why. So, yeah, I wear uh, that flat cap, that orange flat cap. Actually, um, who was it? So, Caleb was wearing it first. I'm not. Caleb was wearing it, and then Christian started wearing it. And um, Super Sam was wearing a flat cap, too. But So, anyway, I just jumped on board with the cool kids and got an orange flat cap. But, no, so on the live streams, I usually like to wear this cap. And I think, I think actually, last week when you and I were talking, uh, this cap was at the house, so I did wear that orange flat cap, but it's safely downstairs in my office. And Corso, you're very welcome. Thank you for watching. Uh, Stoner for Life wants to know, is it common to electrify barbed wire in the States uh, with your fencing? No. Well, so I say that. We just actually had a conversation uh, about having an electric wire separate from the fence behind the fence. Uh, but in talking about the uh, barbed wire, which is typically on top of the fence, no, it, it would not be common uh, to electrify that. Now, I'm sure there's like certain like high security situations where that might be seen in. But if we're talking about commonality, absolutely not. So we're very concerned on liability, right? Uh, so you say in the States, so it makes it sound like you're probably not in the States. But yeah, so we're very worried about liability uh, and getting sued for things. Um, so. Here we can get sued for silly things. Like there is a story, this uh, lady, these two guys had broken into her house. Her her bedroom was up a set of stairs. There was like a balcony there. Her bedroom was on the other side of the balcony. So the guys had, um, had tried to break in her bedroom or something. She shoves one of them backwards over the balcony. He falls, breaks his back or some nonsense, gets really, really hurt. He sues her and wins for some exorbitant amount of money he had broken in there to rob the place, right? So we've got some silly liability laws uh, here in the States. So no, we would not electrify the barbed wire. Um, there would be way too much liability in that. Roger says, great. Now I have an image. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. Now I have an image of Joe and his orange Speedo in the hot tub. Well, let me just help you out with that image and let you know that Joe does not have an orange Speedo. It's not Joe in his orange Speedo because he does not have an orange Speedo. Now, do I have orange board shorts I wear to go swimming? Of course I do, yes, but uh, certainly not Speedo. We'll leave that to uh, Kenny Dugan. That's what Kenny Dugan's always saying, always introducing himself as, like his alter persona or whatever is a swimsuit, like a Speedo model, I think is what he says. Um, but no, I will help you out with that image and let you know that Joe does not own an orange speedo. It is orange board shorts. You're very welcome. Bam Bam says country. Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to stand corrected. Uh, yeah. So country cattle fencing, uh, they, they'll use like a uh, electric barb tape. Okay. So I was thinking, yep. My mind went the wrong place. I was thinking like a high voltage, like, uh, hooked up to the top. So you see that like sometimes in like some really high security areas. Um, yeah, but you're right. So cattle fence does, you would see low voltage applied to that. Um, what did they ask? So is it common to electrify barbed wire? So uh, yeah, so I guess the, the answer, so Bam Bam is correct. And thank you, Bam Bam, for the correction. Um, I guess Michael Taylor is what we're calling you on YouTube. Um, but yeah, so you... It is like in agricultural settings, usually it's a tape. It's usually not barbed wire. It's usually either smooth wire or a tape that you would apply a low voltage uh, alternating current to. Um, I stand corrected. Yeah. So same thing, Joe. Thank you for the correction. Some ag fences in Florida have a hot wire. Yeah. So, um, yeah, 
I, I stand corrected. So it's usually not barbed wire that's electrified. It's usually like a, a, a smooth wire or a tape. So I'm just thinking about a, a horse place here in town uses a lot of the flat tape that has metal strand through it that uh, keeps their horses from chewing on the rest of the fence and for running out of the fence. So, but yeah, anyway. All right. We're to the end of the comment section. So if you guys have any more comments or questions, concerns, drop them in the comments below. We still got an hour and a half. We're not even halfway through this thing. Let's see who has given us a like or a heart. So, well, Taylor gave us a heart. Thank you, wifey, for that. Uh, thumbs up so far, our standstill experts, Michael Taylor and the Fence Industry Podcast. So the rest of you, go ahead. Give us a like and a heart, and I'll say that you gave us a like or a heart sort of thing. <clears throat> All right. Uh, what else? What else should we talk about here, guys? We've got an hour and a half. So here's the thing. So, and maybe I'll consider having agendas for these, but I watch, I watch YouTubes and sometimes I'll watch a live stream that has an agenda and it just feels so scripted, right? It feels really scripted in that you could tell like they're typically watching off screen. They're making sure, okay, I hit this. I'm going to talk about it for a little while. Eyes go down. I'm going to talk about this for a little while. It feels, it doesn't feel real, right? It feels scripted. The whole thing feels weird. I don't know. That's why I don't typically have an agenda for these. But now that I'm an hour in and we're about through the talking points I had in my head, it does stand to reason that maybe we should have a few ideas about where we're going with these. Um, yeah. I will take that under careful consideration. Also, a benefit of having guests on is, like you guys have seen, I, you know who we need? I, okay. So, Ashley says, hey, Joe, happy Saturday. Ashley, happy Saturday to you as well. I need to get a hold of your husband and see about having him on the show. It's been a little while since he's been a guest on the show. Speaking of having guests on the show, and they help this thing go by a little bit faster, we need to have your husband on. It would be good to talk to Kayla, but we can talk about, I think last time we talked, we had talked about the rebranding. It was right around FinTech, so it was right around the rebranding. It'd be good to talk about that and just what's new at Stain Cell Experts. I don't know. I know there's some exciting news on your guys' end. I don't know how public it is, so I'm not going to go into it. But we could talk about that if Caleb would like to come on and talk about that, about uh, the exciting news you guys have on your end. That would be awesome. Also, I'm uh, reaching out to uh, Tony Thornton. Uh, actually, so uh, Tony was this week's uh, guest on uh, Dan Wheeler's podcast talking about uh, Thornton uh, Consultancy or Thornton Consulting Group. Um, talking about Tony Thornton, the uh, past executive director of the American Fence Association, has now uh, is now on his own. On he's opened up a consultancy, so I think it'd be interesting to have Tony on. If you guys watch the show for a while, you know we've had Tony on in the past as executive director of the American Fence Association. Be glad to have him on again. Talk about the consultancy, about what that model looks like. Uh, it's interesting that it's interesting that our industry is kind of moving this way towards. Now, there's always been consultants, right? But uh, more and more you see you see this happening a lot more and i think it's smart for younger contractors to seek out help uh, if you guys don't listen to dan wheeler's podcast you should uh and one of the points that dan had made was that you know guys just starting out in the industry or guys that have started out recently in the industry can bypass 5 10 15 years of pitfalls by having someone like tony thornton come in for a day or two to just go over whether it's operations, whether it's installation, what have you. So there is an initial outlay of monies to get that done, but avoiding those pitfalls, like basically taking their uh, knowledge, their ex years of experience, uh, typically ends up paying off. So be interesting to have that conversation for sure. Joe Rivers, the suggestions for a small company with no yard on cutting down pickup time from vendors. That's always that's always a struggle, right? Is uh, so we went, we we've grown into a pretty substantial place, but it hasn't always. We haven't always had this kind of yard to deal with, and so when my dad had bought this for my granddad, it was our yard was I don't know, it was a hundred deep by hundred wide, or maybe seventy five wide or something. It wasn't very big, and the uh, office and shop were on that, uh, so it wasn't all laid down area. We've certainly had that heart, had that problem in the past. So what we what we would do then is we would team up with other fence companies. So other fence companies about our size, 
they had a similar situation, right? To say, hey, we don't have enough yard to bring in a truckload of wire, but I also don't want to pay a, a broken truck or a partial truck fee or a broken pallet fee if we're only needing three or four rolls. Like, can we go in together and buy a truckload, right? Do I need some of it? Do you, can we build a truckload out of three or four of us? Kind of like a co-op, right? So in the agriculture industry, co-ops are totally normal. You'll have three, four, five, six farmers going together to buy a truckload of feed or silage or whatever. Um, so kind of taking that that concept, right? So teaming up with other fence guys in our area and and trying to buy in bulk as a buying group, I guess you would call that, uh, or a co-op. So uh, pickup times from vendors are always a pain. Um, just, I mean, think about the volume that they're going through, right? So, I mean, we're fortunate that we get deliveries, but so even, even with little to no yard, so we didn't have it. We didn't have uh, wholesalers here in our market. Whether we're talking about, I mean, back in the day, it was uh, Merchants Metals, uh, Stevens, um, Jameson, I guess, was around Master Halco. Um, so, but none of them were in Springfield. So we're we're always ever three hours away from anybody, which is kind of one of the one of the driving forces to us opening up a regional supply house. Is that there are no suppliers in our area. So we were having to have deliveries one way or the other, uh, Joe. So I probably, I, I guess I probably can't talk on, you know, if you're having no yard and you're going to the vendor to pick up, cause we never even had that available is having a vendor to pick up from. Um, but having small yard and not enough space to put actual inventory, that's kind of what we would do is we would team up with three or four other fence companies about our size to then all share a delivery. So maybe that's an option, Joe, maybe it's not. I hope that, Hope that helps somewhat. Josh says, Joe, do you predict that the market price for steel continue to rise? Same with other commodities, wood, vinyl. Let me know what your thoughts. So here's a here's kind of an odd thing. So the wholesale or so the price of bulk steel, um, like pig iron, that sort of thing, uh, iron rod, steel rod, actually came down a few months ago. Um but we didn't see that reflected in the finished price, right? We didn't see that in tube. We didn't see that. Uh, well, I, so I say that. So when I was up in Wyoming, up at Brenton Manufacturing, there's another, uh, there's another individual there that had he was a uh, he was a distributor for a pipe company. And uh, so I don't want to name names or call anybody out here, but he was he was a, a distributor for a pipe manufacturer. And he had gotten a notice. Now, this was, like I said, two months ago, three months ago. He had gotten a notice that because of the price of the raw steel was going down, price of tube and pipe was going down. Uh, I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. So maybe the price of steel is coming down eventually. And then it never trickled down. I don't know that we ever saw any sort of notice on uh, on the lower tiers as to any sort of price de decrease, right? So it's kind of interesting to, to hear a manufacturer uh, and he showed me the email that they had sent him um, saying that they would have a three to 5% price decrease. And then uh, that never actually ended up trickling down to the, uh, the retail level or the end user level. So do you predict the market prices still continue to rise? Probably. I mean, he, I think here's the problem we're in guys is that whether we're talking about steel, we're talking about wood, vinyl, whatever. I think, I think a certain percentage of this increase is because the manufacturers and wholesalers have, have kind of figured out that the market can absorb it. Like the market will pay an increased price. I mean, obviously we're still having supply issues on chain link chain link wire is something that I've been watching lately, but we're still having supply issues on, on chain link on anything, custom order, forget about it. Same thing. I hear that from, from on the vinyl side that, uh, who was I talking to? I was talking to a vinyl guy two days ago uh, that was just frustrated that he could only get six foot white. So he had a project that was white post and rail with tan insert. And, um, you know, this particular vendor said that that wasn't option. They were only doing white. Um, so it's interesting to see that we're still having supply issues with price increases that we've seen. Like we've seen incredible price increases over the last two years and demand hasn't waned any. Or, or maybe not any, but it hasn't waned noticeably, right? So I think a lot of manufacturers and wholesalers are picking up on that. They're like, wait a minute. 
So we've raised a price 50%, 60%, and there still isn't, we still can't keep up. You know, there's still demand for what we're selling. Interesting. So I, I unfortunately, I don't think prices are going down because I think the market has figured out whether we're talking about manufacturers or wholesalers have figured out that the market will pay it. So there's not an, right now, there's not an incentive for the price to go down when supply is still an issue. So my one person's opinion, my prediction, I guess, is that no, I don't see price in, unless something major happens in the economy, right? So that's always the wild card. Everyone's talking about housing market cooling. They're talking about the automotive market cooling. I was listening to a podcast yesterday. I said for the first time in three years, uh, the the used car market is on a decline. So that's kind of interesting. There's also there also there's also talks about uh, home foreclosures on the east and west coast going up. So banks are foreclosing on houses on the east and west coast, which here in the Midwest we typically we typically are about six or eight months behind that. Um, there's also talk about there's going to be this summer a huge surge in ho housing finishes. So housing starts were at a record high. That means housing finishes, houses coming onto the market are going to be an all-time high. But the Fed is raising interest rates, which is going to increase mortgage rates, right? So there's also talk about that having an impact, impact on the housing market. I say all this to say there's a lot of question marks in the economy right now. So I don't know. It, it, unless something major changes in the economy, Josh, I don't see price of steel coming down. Um, I really don't. I hope I'm wrong. I do. I really hope I'm wrong. But I don't see there. I don't see that there's an incentive for the price to come down right now. Like I said everyone's paying it, and there's still demand for it. So why would you? You know, if you're in their shoes, why would you bring the price down when when you're getting what you ask for 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 pay, and you still can't keep up with the demand? Why, why lower the price, right? I hope, but we'll see. Maybe Chris Caruso and Caleb to promote your May 6th event. So, yes. Uh, so, Chris is scheduled to come on. Let me see. Uh, so, he's coming on in two weeks on the 23rd. So, I think that would be a great idea. Have Caleb on as well uh, to talk about the event on May 6th. There's the date. So we'll be in the Philadelphia up at uh, Kasurik Distributors. So I am looking forward to that for sure. You're right. I will reach out to Caleb or maybe just put a bug in his ear that in two weeks, Chris is going to be on and we could have, we could have a group video. What are we calling these? What are we calling these? Live video podcast. There you go. We'll, uh, we'll have them all on it. All right. Roger says, I just wanted to mention that you have some great interaction with your viewers and possibly the best group of viewers. Truly a fence fam. I agree. I agree. But Roger, that sounded like a little bit of a pat on your own back because you're like, I want to mention you have some great interaction. Thank you with your viewers and possibly the best group of viewers. A little bit of a pat on the back for yourself, but I agree. I agree. I agree. Now the community that we're building here, guys, I like this community a lot. I'm telling you what, the best time I had in New Orleans at FinTech was meeting in person, in real life, some of the people that I interact with uh, here on the show weekly. So I agree. It is a it is a great group. I appreciate you guys a lot. Even if Roger's patting himself on the back there a little bit. That's okay. That's all right. Truly a Fence fam is right. Annie Miller said, can you talk about what your sales presentation typically looks like? We're using my salesman to pre-qualify, but when you go to meet with a homeowner, do you present catalogs, measure with a wheel, aim for a one for a one close call, et cetera? No, we don't, we don't go out. So this, this started before the pandemic, but one thing that the pandemic really taught us is how easy it is for one person to spread whatever's going around, whether it's the spring flu or whether it's, I don't care how easy it is for us to help spread things, right? So we did the math. <clears throat> Each one of our sales representatives would interact with 50 to 60 people a week. And I I think that's a conservative number. I think probably when you factor in, you know, gas station attendance because you're using more fuel or, you, or you're eating out more, so you're talking about interacting with the, with the fast food service staff, minimum 50, 60 people a week per person who is then 
coming back to the office and sharing whatever they've picked up with everyone else who is also sharing whatever they've picked up with everybody else. It's a, it can be a Petri dish, right? So moving forward. So that taught us that in-person sales might be more detrimental than what it's worth, right? In terms of keeping our team healthy and safe, their families healthy and safe, our potential clients healthy and safe. I mean, sometimes you don't know that you're sick until several days later, right? So sometimes you could be passing things on from someone that you picked it up without even knowing it. So in terms of safety, in terms of health and safety, part of our pandemic response plan is that we don't go out in person until we have a signed contract and a paid deposit. I understand. That sounds crazy. However, using tools such as my salesman, which we also use, and I like a lot, uh, we also use the GIS maps from the from our county assessor to verify kind of a, a second step in verifying that the measurements are actually right. What they think is their lot is actually their lot size as far as width and depth goes. Uh, and then we'll jump on a phone call, talk about what their needs are, what their goals are with the fence, what what service the fence is offering, right? What problem is it solving for them? And make sure the type of fence that they're selecting is the best at solving that problem. Uh, again, verify the measurements. We can also... So if if there's a question, if we've gone through the my salesman and the GIS, typically it stops there. But if there's another question, we can go off of Google Earth as well. Use it as kind of a third, you know, a third verification measure. Measure. Uh, but what we found is over a hundred foot, this thing's accurate within two feet, pretty close, right? So when we turn when we factor in lost time on lost sales or no sales, uh, lost fuel on no sales, on opportunity cost, on not being able to see someone who is willing to move forward because we're seeing someone who is simply price shopping. It wasn't even a conversation, right? So this, like I said, it it, it started prior to, to the pandemic, but one thing the pandemic taught us is this is the way moving forward. So uh, now the email does include a presentation as far as the layout, as far as the materials they're receiving, any sales literature that we would have handed out in person is sent digitally. Uh, the contracts are digitally signed. Uh, we use Job Nimbus, but they have a they have a feature similar to DocuSign that's used in the real estate industry, the banking industry. It's accepted, uh, and then we send them a invoice electronically that can be paid via check in the mail or it can be paid right then using a credit card. Uh, through a, a service called WePay, which is owned by a company called Chase. I say a company called Chase. I think everyone is very, very familiar with the financial Chase. Um, and then after all that, so we get a deposit back, we get a contract back, signed contract back. Then we schedule a time because it is important that we do see this site, right? So that we can answer any questions in person. We can, we, they can meet us. They can see exactly who they're dealing with, that sort of thing, get comfortable with, with our company. But by pushing that off until this sale is 100% done, we have a contract, we have a deposit, it works out for everybody, right? It also doesn't waste the client's time by scheduling a half hour because they're not only going to be home for the half hour, they're going to be home prior and probably they've got a couple contractors. If they're smart, they've, they've stacked these up, uh, they're going to waste half a day, right? Whereas using the My, my Salesman Quote tool, they can have a conversation on a lunch break. We do a lot of phone conversations during the lunch hour. We can shoot them a price that day. They've now not had to take that day off work. It can be a win-win if it's presented correctly. Um, so, I, Andy, I hope that helps. We don't do in-person. Uh, we obviously, therefore, don't focus on the one-call close. I'm Even when we were doing in-person uh, consultations, I say interviews, in-person consultations, we weren't focused on the one-call close. I... I understand there's companies that have success with that, you know, by saying, hey, here's today's offer. As soon as I leave, it goes up, whatever, 10%. I'm of the opinion people don't want to be sold, right? People want to make educated buying decisions, and those are different. And by aiming for a one-call close, I think that's putting that's pushing sales more than it is consultations. And there is a difference. I think consultations are more towards the forming an educated buying decision rather than just trying to sell them something. Um, 
hope that helps. I really do. Uh, that's just kind of our process. Uh, I know some people still do in-person proposals. Totally fine. Uh, I mean, there, there's some guys I talk to that say, I listen, I need to be on site to explain to them why they should choose this and all that. If that works for you, totally fine. Uh, I rather, our process is we just over-educate. You know, we educate and then we give them a little bit more. And if it makes sense for us to work with them on the project, we'd love to. If it makes sense for them to work with someone else on the project, to be the best experience for the customer. That's what we're here for, right? Best customer service, period. So that's our process. That's what works for us. Uh, Victoria would like to know, is it too late to stain a several-year-old cedar fence? Not at all. You just got to clean it. So depending on uh, what kind of organic growth is involved, it would depend on what cleaner you would use. You know, if it's a couple years old and it's got no organic growth, something like a sodium percarbonate would work well. Uh, you could also get into fence cleaners, uh, actual cleaning chemicals. All this can be found at Stainless Steel Expert site. It's actually linked in the, uh, you're watching on YouTube. So in the description below, uh, check out Stainless Steel Experts. They have a full line of cleaning uh, supplies there. Also, you can uh, check out my channel. I reviewed a few of, of their cleaning supplies. Eco cleaner, the wood cleaner, the wood stripper, that sort of thing. The answer is no, it's never too late unless the fence has already fallen down and is in total disrepair. And then I guess it would be, but if it's only several years old, then you've got plenty of time. Uh, Josh says, I agree on the prices. Same thoughts. Yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's no motivation. There's absolutely no motivation to bring the price down. So, you know, it's unfortunately it kind of is what it is, right? I hope they come down, but well, I, I kind of do and I kind of don't because in order for the prices to come down, I think our economy is really going to have to cool and slow down. Uh, just to support, just to figure out the supply line issues. Uh, and I don't like the sounds of that, right? So we've got a rainy day fund. We've got a winter fund kind of set up to where we'll be okay. But I don't know. I it's, It would be interesting to see kind of what the six months to a year bring. Kenny Dugan says, speaking of farm fence, we're, we're Bodark Osage Orange post fans, but switching over to pipe for fire issues. Interesting. Osage Orange or Bodark. I'll be honest, Kenny. I've never heard of Bodark. Oh, well, I say that. There's a town here called Bodark. It's spelled differently, but you, you get it. Um, Osage Orange post fans, but switching over to pipe for fire issues. Yep, absolutely. So, I mean, and so fire issues, but also longevity issues, right? So any natural product is going to have lifespan issues right so now luckily in texas humidity well, depending on what part of texas i guess uh, humidity isn't as much of an issue so you probably get a little bit longer lifespan out of those wood posts um, but a steel post is always going to outperform so in your guys's market kind of that southwest market i see a lot one i'm kind of jealous because you guys eight foot fences are totally normal down there um, but a lot of those are done on the two and a half inch round steel post, have like a C like a 40 weight CS 40 SS 40 schedule, like whatever you want. I understand schedule 40 is different than CS 40, 40 weight pipe, two and a half inch, 40 weight pipe. Uh, I'm pretty jealous. I like that. I like that a lot. Now I would rather they be done on postmasters. I think postmaster is a cleaner look because the round two and a half inch post, you still, you you have to cap them some, well, you don't have to. You can leave them for everyone to see, but if you want to cap them, then you have to kind of like box around them. Actually, we did a review on this channel probably, I don't know, a year and a half ago, two years ago now, on uh, April Wilkerson's, her first, the first video of hers that we reviewed. Uh, she had created like some boxes that went around her two and a half inch round post. I don't know. It still looks like a, a square box every six foot or however far, however you guys do. I think it's six foot on eight foot fence down there, but um, might be four foot, I guess. But anyway, um, it still looks like a weird box bolted onto your fence every so often, six foot, four foot, whatever. Um, yeah. So Postmaster Post would have probably a better or all right, not just Postman. I understand there's life lifetime posts. There's all sorts. There's purpose-built post, any one of those that can be hidden easily gets my vote over like the round post. Now, that being said, I probably should be a fan of round posts because we sell the hardware to bolt those on, you know, to bolt two or fours to the wood post. So Candace and retail wholesale probably doesn't love it that that's what I'm saying, but because we don't sell, we sell the postmaster post retail. We don't sell them wholesale. We don't ship them. 
we sell them wholesale in person. We don't ship them because shipping something like that has to go freight and then it gets a little expensive. Um, anyway. Cosmic Osmo 4. I like the name. I can't find any examples or diagrams of how to make an intersection of two fences, T intersection, using Postmasters. Uh, do you have any videos showing an example of that? Ah, uh, we don't, but that's certainly a good idea. So, I mean, it would take two posts. So you would you would have, you know, you're wanting a sideways fence. You're wanting a perpendicular intersection there, something like that, um, right? So you would want you would want two posts. Now that being said, we we only use what Postmaster now calls their line posts. We don't use their in posts. Um, but you would want to have two. You would want to have two posts there at that intersection. I would think. Um, yeah, I mean, you could run with one post. Your, you know, your perpendicular two before. I guess you could. It, it wouldn't be great, but you could toenail that into the perpendicular rails uh, at the post. You know, set a post at your perpendic perpendicular intersection. Um, I would rather set two posts just so that we're totally sure it's going to be really nice and strong. Um, yeah, we'll add that to the suggestions board, though. Great question. Roger says, not self-congratulations. I'm a fan of Mark Olson's. 157 channels in my remarks don't equally apply over there. Good to know. Good to know, Roger. Appreciate that. No, I was just, I was just giving you a hard time. Roger's, listen, Roger, we were talking about you before this thing went live. I was talking to we're Joan Braden around the the uh, studio here and all that and and one of the things is like listen, we've got some guys that have been here for a while and they're here consistently. There's this guy Roger. He's here almost every week, and when he's not here, we start getting a little bit worried about him. We want to make sure he's okay. But uh, no, I it was all in good fun, Roger. We appreciate you being here, and I'm you know. No comment on the fans of other people's channels. I, I think, listen, I think we're building community here, right? Whether we're talking about this channel or Mark's or Sean's or, or Danny Cannon's or whoever's, maybe we can get Dan Wheeler to start a video channel. Hmm? All right, let's talk about that. Well, let's put a pin in Roger's thing real quick. Dan's been twisting my arm to turn this into a podcast. I understand it's easy. I understand we can do it. We will be doing it. It is on the list. Dan, here's me twisting your arm to say your show should also be a video show. Because just as easy as it is to take video, take this content and create a podcast, there are tons of podcasts that also have a video component. They have the video version of the podcast. I, there's another guy named Joe. You may have heard of him. He's is Joe Rogan. He's got a pretty good sized show uh, on Spotify. Uh, he also has the video component, right? Like, listen, that's the only way that I consume Joe Rogan's content. I cannot sit through a three hour podcast. I just, I can't do it. I've tried it. I think his stuff is incredibly entertaining and educational at exactly the same time, which is important. I can't do it, but I can watch his video content. So I do. He pops up on my YouTube feed when I, in the evening, when I'm sitting there watching YouTube. So, Dan Wheeler, I am formally calling you out to start a YouTube channel in conjunction with your podcast. So, take that for what it's worth. All right, let's pull the pin out of the conversation about uh, creating. Oh, just a second. Well, this is kind of interesting. So sometimes we do have uh, like people that come on and just like spam the channel. Um, and usually I just like block them and I don't give them. But this is kind of funny. So it says, hey, V. And then he calls himself Indian scammer. Okay, good to know. Thank you for identifying yourself as an Indian scammer. So we will just block the user and then we will all move on. All right. Um, so no, so Roger, where I was going before I put the pin in that real quick, um, is about building a uh, building a community, right? Whether regardless of whose channel that we're talking about, I think the ultimate goal here is to build a community that similar to what we're seeing on Facebook, like, there are probably six or eight Facebook groups that revolve around fencing, 
I think that's phenomenal. Like we are building, we are building a bigger community. When I was a kid, we would, we would talk to other fence guys in town. Unfortunately, we weren't involved with the AFA, so we didn't go to fence tech. So our, our sphere of knowledge around the fencing industry was limited to the three or four fence guys that we talked to here in our local market. And really we talked to them a couple of times a year at the, at the home show and at the lawn and garden show. Right. And if we needed something, we could always pick up the phone and give them a call for, for whatever reason, something changed there. And it, and it doesn't sound like it was only in our market. I think people went through this where actually, so Caleb and I have had this conversation, I think on here, I mean, he's on his show, but talking about, um, you know, when, for some reason, our industry went through a phase of it went it, it went away from you know our granddads having coffee with the other guys and talking about what they're going through and how they fix things, how they can help each other. To then something in our dad's era uh, went away from that. It went more towards hey, what's what my secret? I'm going to keep my secrets to myself because I don't want to you to learn them and for you to beat me at the thing I'm doing. Right. Like, so I, my competitive advantage is I'm going to keep all my secrets to myself. The thing is, everyone has the same version of those secrets. Right. Like, I, now I'm sure there are some good ones out there. I'm sure there's some just earth shattering revelations that a few, few people are keeping in their back pocket. By and large, we all have the same versions of the same problems and we all have similar versions of similar solutions to those similar problems. Right. So what I'm seeing now through the growth of these Facebook groups, through these channel, through these video channels or these video, these right. And through the dance podcast, through the community coming together, I think we're getting back to that morning coffee with the other professionals but on such a larger scale, right? So once a week, we can sit here and talk with each other in real time about what we're going through. And we're from all parts of the world, right? So we're talking to people from the UK. We've got viewers so that they typically comment later on over in like Australia, New Zealand, that sort of area. It's crazy that we can have near, I say near real time, because there's some parts of the world right now that aren't watching because it's, late at night or early morning, however you want to say it. But we can have a conversation, right, about what's going on in our industry. We can have a conversation. So DNJ Projects, need to reach out to them, have them on again about, uh, we can have conversations with other tradesmen in other parts of the country or other parts of the world about what they're going through and how they're kind of similar to what we're going through, right? So we're building a community, I guess is the point. Now, regardless of whose community it is, this is overall like the larger community is the fence fam, right? That's who I always shout out to. It's who I always talk to. I view it as just our industry in general's group is the fence fam. The community is the fence fam. And Roger's a good example of Roger's not even a fence guy, right? He's not even in the fencing world, but he's here every week. He wants to talk about content. He wants to talk about fence stuff. He's in the fence fam, period. So anyway, building community is where I was going with that one. Uh, <laughs> all right. So Roger says, even if I had feelings, your comment wouldn't have hurt any. Well, okay. Okay. All right. Good to know. Well, I didn't mean to though. So yeah. So project mail music can't wait for DJ to be back on. I, I agree. So those guys, those guys are hard at work and they work Saturday. So like, I always want to be cognizant of that when I'm asking them to come on the show, like I'm asking them to step away uh, from their business. Now, I understand there's, there's a, a significant time. There's six hours difference between here and there. So it's actually in their afternoon. Anyway, I will reach out to them. I will send them a WhatsApp message and, uh, see about having them back on as well. I really like those guys. Uh, I, I am incredibly, I mean, I'm third generation, right? So I learned from my dad and learned from my granddad. So anytime I can watch a channel that incorporates multiple generations, I'm here for it. I love it a lot. So, uh, yeah, enjoy having those guys on for sure. Guys, let's do this. So usually I tease this at the end. So this week's video, I usually show you guys early, except for last week. We had a little technical faux pas, and we actually, instead, <laughs> instead of uploading it at 1.45 in the afternoon, we uploaded it at 1.45 in the morning. So you guys already saw it before 
the show was on. So we didn't do it last week. But typically, we show you guys an early sneak preview of the video that's coming up. Oh, we had a couple comments come in. Austin Johnson would like to know, what's your recommendation for building a hurricane-proof wood fence? No such thing. Uh, Hurricane-proof, right? So we're talking like wind speeds of several hundred miles an hour with straight-line winds and whatever those winds have picked up and is throwing through the air at several hundred miles an hour. I don't – I mean, you. we could talk about a cast-in-place concrete fence – with rebar and with all sorts of supporting structures maybe that's it but if we're talking about a wooden fence hurricane proof i don't know that there is one i guys if you if you if the community that's watching has any suggestions by all means i mean i know so there's the uh, postmaster plus posts that i i reference it all the time because that's what i use that's what i'm knowledgeable about there's other purpose-built post in the market um it has like a 72 73 mile an hour wind load rating so that that doesn't even come close to hurricane force right and when you look at the documentation the testing uh it has the strongest wind load capability when we're talking about you know schedule as compared to schedule 40 uh steel round pipe as compared to four before treated pine four before cedar I mean, there's, they don't even come close. I think four before wood, I think four before pressure of pine was something like 58, 59 miles an hour. So that's not even at 59 miles an hour. That's not even a hurricane, right? Like that's a tropical storm, I think. So hurricane proof fence. I don't wood fence. I don't think it exists. I really don't Austin. I mean, I would love to stand corrected. If there's anybody out there that has an idea how you build a hurricane proof wooden fence, I think that would make some phenomenal content and I'm here for it. Um, I don't know that it exists. And of course it says, what is the best way to cut the top of a post already installed? So very carefully, right? So it sounds like the posts are already up, but uh, meaning that the two before and pickets are already installed. So we would typically, yeah, we typically cut them after the two before go up before the pickets go up so that we have access to both sides of the post. Um, so there, you could use a skill saw, right? But a skill saw is not going to get all the way through. So then you could, you could use, what is it? The Japanese saw, which is a, uh, it looks like a file, but it's actually a saw with a handle on one side. You could use one of those. So now it's going to take a minute to get through. So the skill saw gets the majority of that bulk cut, but you're still going to have, you're still going to have a layer there that skill saw doesn't get to. Uh, now, um, as I'm talking about this, so there are larger worm drive skill saws out there that use larger blades. I haven't used them, but, um, Maybe something like that. Maybe a, a a worm drive skill saw that's got a larger blade on it. The problem is you would have to have... <clears throat> so these posts are four or four, typically three and a half by three and a half. So you'd have to have a blade that was something like eight inch, eight or nine inches to get all the way through, right? So half the distance, but then also you have that inner... You have the drive, right? The drive spine, spline that's that this thing's bolted to so that takes so you don't even have it's more than half so you'd have to have like a nine inch blade or something on it eight and a quarter eight and a half something like that so um yeah so something like a japanese saw so you'd skill saw the majority of the bulk out of there and then japanese saw the rest of it uh it would take a while but if, the, if all the fence is up that's how i'd cut it Uh, Will Carrot says, oh my gosh, was just watching an old video of yours. Now I see that you're live. I have a question for sure. Send it, Will. We're here for a while. Always happy to answer questions. Uh, and of course, it says, oh, okay, so the, the pickets aren't up yet. So no siding yet. So that's a little bit easier, right? It's a little bit easier to access there. Um, so still skill saw the one side. Now, even with the two by four on there, typically you could get a skill saw in because you're just needing to get a little bit more. So typically you could use a skill saw on the other side, keep it nice and clean and straight. That's how I do it. You're welcome. All right. 
let's review. I'm excited about this week's video. So as you guys know, you guys have already seen a couple of interviews that I had with Briston of Brenton Manufacturing up in Casper, Wyoming. The whole reason I went there was to get a video of their Burgandy weaving machine. Now, when I got up there, I realized it was incredibly louder than I had anticipated. I'd never been in a like a, a wire manufacturing outfit. So we we had to film the B-roll there, do a voice over here with some like marrying up of that content. It took a little bit to get all those dots connected, but they've been connected and we have a video for you, but not before we answer Will's question. Will says, when I pull up my existing post to move the fence back to the true property line, do I need to chip off the old concrete or add new and add new or question mark? Yeah, that's, yeah. So you, you could reset it. You could, you'd have to dig a much bigger hole and reset that post in the new hole and then pour concrete around the old concrete. I would prefer just to chip the concrete off. I understand that is an incredible undertaking, just getting all the concrete off. Um, but that's the way, right, is chipping the old concrete off so that you're setting into an entire plug of new concrete. You're not worried about new concrete binding to old concrete. You're not trying to, you know, drill anchor points into the old concrete for the new concrete to grab onto, like rebar or something like that. If it's me, if it's my... Honestly, if it's if it's my fence, I probably set new posts just to do away with the whole thing altogether. But if we're you if we're set on reusing those posts, uh, the old concrete would come off. Hope that helps. All right, this week's video is the Burgandy weaving machine. If you guys have comments, drop them in the comments below. We can watch this thing together and uh, go from there. Let's see if this works. It does. That hand weaving operation was something to see. It was it was an incredible operation. I mean, you want to talk about just raw labor to build that fence? Unreal. Ah, man. All right. No sound. Okay, so let's figure this contraption out. All right, so, all right, let's take it down off screen share. Uh, yep, no audio. Okay, stop screen. We're going to share screen. There's something about this. Chrome tab. Share, share tab audio. Okay. Make... Make this one big. All right. I will restart this and let me know if you have audio now. Well, I guess I should. So we just released the right, review video All where right. I saw a couple different wire weaving options or operations. One using a machine. We later learned it's a Burgandy machine. And then a hand. All right. We'll pause for a minute. Why don't you guys tell me if you've got screen audio? It's good. Okay. Hey, this is the, this is a great reason for Braden to be here. You can tell me if we've got audio or not. We're learning here. This is Braden's first day here. We're figuring it out. All right, here we go. And weaving operation somewhere overseas. I got a pretty interesting message the day this thing released from Gabe over at Brenton Manufacturing up in Casper, Wyoming, inviting me up to see their Burgandy wire weaving machine, how it works, and let me get all the nitty gritty information on the machine. And I kind of generally view their operation. So, like any fence geek out there, my answer was absolutely yes. I've booked my airfare and I'm on my way. Let's go. What is up, everybody? And welcome back. Through the magic of YouTube editing, here we are in Casper, Wyoming. This video is a pretty good example of why I need somebody to, uh, like a videographer here. Because I didn't realize until we were editing this that the uh, entire thing was out of focus. So, sorry for that.
Now, yesterday when I came in, it was a little bit uh, odd. It was 50-some-odd degrees, no snow. And I thought, this is not the Wyoming I've heard about. But then I woke up this morning, snow on the ground and 11 degrees. So here we are. First and foremost, I appreciate you having me out. Yeah. Uh, you, you guys were grac- so gracious yesterday to take me through the entire plant here and show me kind of what makes it tick. And I'll tell you what, this is an impressive operation. Well, thank you. Thank you. The plan was we were going to take the YouTube audience uh, step-by-step through the wire weaving machine that they saw in a recent reaction video. But those things are a little bit loud. (laughs) They are. So what I'm going to do, guys, is uh, I took plenty of B-roll to where I'm going to walk you guys through step-by-step with a voiceover uh, to give you guys a really good idea on exactly how those machines work. Coming up next. All right, guys. So first off, we start at the smooth strand where the whole process starts. Now, this has already been woven through the machine. The machine is now drawing it from these coils through the pulleys that we're going to see here in a minute. So it's getting drawn through these pulleys, and actually it's a series of pulleys that are both pulling the wire but also tensioning the wire as well. So you guys are just getting a taste of the of how noisy this thing is. So the other three, they have four of these machines all running at the same time. It was incredibly loud in this place. But but you get used to it, right? But it wouldn't have been any good to have me try to film this whole thing, you know, in real time. So the strand's getting pulled through the series of pulleys into the system that's going to start forming it into the half diamonds that we're used to seeing chain link consist of. It's a pretty quick process. This wire is moving at a pretty high rate of speed. So this is showing us exactly how the machine is set up and where it is in the process. So whether we're talking about diamond counts, the blade speed is how fast the machine is running. Uh, Picket count is how many individual pickets have been run, uh, both in this set and the uh, what it's uh, what it's set for and what it's actually run. It's also seeing it's also showing how many rolls have been removed and then how many rolls have been made on the day. So this is where the magic happens. The wire is brought into this system of tooling uh, that forms it both in the diamond pattern, but also it's weaving it with the other strand that has also come in. It's making two pickets at once here. You can see the blade cutting it at a predetermined uh, length. So it's actually keeping track of how many diamonds run through this machine. And at a predetermined diamond count, which is what was said in the screen before, it will stop and cut the uh, individual pickets or both pickets at once. And these blades are one incredibly strong because they're cutting through galvanized steel, but also incredibly sharp because it's not leaving a burr at the end of that, which I thought you might end up seeing. So th- these machines are so detailed. So it's you can adjust how much of that. So you can adjust where the blades cut within that diamond. Uh, and because what I later learned is the so this machine you will see here in a minute is set up for knuckle twist. So the knuckles, the knuckles uh, aren't as long. So the the pigtail that's left over where it cuts, the amount of that strand left doesn't have to be as much on the knuckle side as it does on the twist side. So rather than cutting that diamond in half, it cuts it an offset to allow a little bit more on the twist side. These things are so incredibly detailed. So what you see here is the inner workings of the magic of this machine. And so you see a a cylinder type worm drive around a rectangular tooling uh, that's giving the diamond the shape. So the worm drive is really establishing how wide those diamonds are. And then the rectangular tooling is giving the wire its shape. And as you can see, it's weaving two pickets at the same time. It's really something to see. Here's a good look at it in action. You can tell why the cover's on this machine because it makes quite the mess. It's really, it did make an incredible mess. Like I felt bad. I asked them, hey, can we take this cover off and do some video? And they said, yeah, absolutely. Sure. No problem. Well, then it made such an incredible, like I felt bad. I I offered to mop it up because like this, it made an incredible mess on the floor. Like I I will take care of that. I'm so sorry. Uh, Of course, they were really gracious hosts. I said, no problem. We got it. But it makes an incredible mess impressive to me the speed at which i thought the cover was on there just to keep all this stuff secret like like out of like out of sight sort of thing no it is there to contain this lubricating fluid because it goes everywhere this machine runs at and 
this machine really wasn't working at full at full force either. It, they they were saying it could be tuned up a little bit more to go a little bit faster if production needed. So that was kind of an interesting point too that I learned that they they produce nine gauge, eleven gauge, and eleven and a half gauge at different speeds, and you can actually so you can produce nine gauge a little bit faster, which seemed counterintuitive. It's a thicker core or it's a thicker wire, so you'd think it'd take more energy to turn it through all that tooling through the worm drives and through the tooling. Uh, but their point is, well, you can actually run faster because the nine gauge doesn't have as much flop in it. So it has less, you know, if it flops and it misweaves, you've got to stop, back it up, reweave it, and then move on. So 11 and a half is just a lot more floppy. I think that's the industry term is floppy um, than nine gauge. So 11 and a half gauge, you actually run at a slower speed than nine gauge. I thought that was interesting. But the faster this machine runs, the more misweaves and overall mistakes it could make. So there's a sweet spot that uh, Brenton seemed to have this thing dialed in at. So here we see the wire being woven over a series of tensioners. Now it looks like they were weaving knuckle twists at the time. So the far turret is knuckling the wire. And then, so actually, let me back up here for a second. So having watched this thing run, um, I know kind of what we're looking at now. So, uh, let me see. Uh, it might be hard. I mean, it, it looks like they were ago. weaving knuckle twists at the time. So, the far... Okay. So, there you see, just past that knuckling turret, it left one diamond unknuckled. So, most of these you see bent over past the turret, except for the one that's two past the turret is left undone. That's how they know where the 50-foot mark is. So... On the other side, there's a helper that's rolling wire off the line, that's taking it off, taking this the strand out at the 50 foot, hoggering it together, putting it onto the skid to go out, sort of thing. So there's a red light that flashes, and then so he sees that red uh, red light out of his peripheral. He knows that this unknuckled portion. Now, also, if this was a wider shot, it's also untwisted, so that when it comes through all the tensioners and around. He knows that's the 50 foot measurement. So he pulls that strand out with a tool and breaks it right at 50 foot. So that's, that's how he knows where that was always kind of my thought is like, how do they know where the 50 foot is? It's because of that untwisted or unknuckled portion right there. Turret is knuckling the wire. And then the turret closest to us on the right is uh, twisting the wire. A closer look at the knuckling turret. So it looks like they're doing like 11 and a half gauge here. And a closer look at the twisting turret. Now you'll notice on both the knuckling and the I'm twisting the turret, there's a finger that pops up right where the top of that. So you see that finger there. Um, that way when it's twisting or it's knuckling, it doesn't crush that diamond. It doesn't deform the diamond. But that was an diamond too. needs to be so that either the knuckler or the twisting turret don't twist or knuckle the wire too far. It makes for a perfect top diamond. So this arm is a tensioning arm. It makes sure that there's a consistent pressure placed on the wire because it's rolling the wire at a different speed that it's producing the wire pickets. So this tensioning arm makes sure that a consistent pressure stays on the wire while it's rolling it up. So on the back end, this is the uh, chain link take up portion. So as, as you see, it's rolling the wire up. Now the, the standard tension or the regulated tension is important so that you get a nice clean roll so you don't get some mishappen rolls that uh, if you've been in the industry for any length of time, you've seen one or two of these. So what he's getting ready to do here is the machine has indicated that, uh, so you can't even see it. So where, what he's getting ready to grab, so he watched that unknuckled and untwisted portion come through all this and start to get rolled up. That's when he took the roll off and he's getting ready to pull that picket out. At a certain picket count, he's at 50 feet. So uh, the picket is so that what happens is the knuckling and the twisting turret miss a picket at the 50 foot mark. So he knows that he's looking for this unknuckled picket so that then he'll pull it out to complete the 50 foot roll. He'll also then put the picket in to start the next roll. That's why there's always a picket at the end of those rolls too, which I always thought was so nice. 
I thought it was there because it helped us weave the two roles together, which it does. Uh, but I didn't know it was actually just left over from the process of taking these roles apart. Uh, this that process happened so fast. Like he did it several times to try to let me catch that on video, but he's just so fast at it that it was it was hard to catch. All right, guys, we are in for a treat. So last day of the year, I was getting ready to start packing up when they let me know they're going to start running the vinyl extrusion machine. I've seen this thing run on their videos on their Facebook. I can't wait to see it run in person. I'm actually going to grab the camera and walk you guys through this whole process because as a fence guy, I think this stuff is amazing. Let me grab you real quick. All right, guys, so here we have the uh, complete extruding setup. We'll go a little bit more detail, but uh, this is... So what's funny is, so these take-ups, so this this can be the same wire that... So this take-up is the same wire that they were making galvanized chain link out of. Like, they've got just a warehouse stacked with these things. Size alone is pretty impressive. Uh, we're going to start off with just regular galvanized uh, strands, similar to what they're weaving across the room on the uh, chain link machine. It's going to go up through some tensioners to make sure that that strand is really nice and tight, no kinks or anything like that. It's going to go through a cleaner, a wire wheel cleaner, to make sure that wire is super clean. It then goes through some straighteners, making sure that the wire that comes out is incredibly straight so that when the vinyl gets applied to it, it gets extruded over it rather, that it's nice and evenly coated. Now this is the extruder itself. As you guys can see, that's pretty hot. It's about 350 degrees. Uh, it's heating up these pellets. So the pellets you can see are in this big bin. The pellets are sucked up into the hopper and uh, that's feeding them into the tube. Let me show you guys what these pellets look like real quick. So they're vinyl beads, little vinyl pellets. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it almost looks like, uh, I don't know, milk chocolate pellets kind of. So those are being fed into this hopper here. So then it feeds it down this conveyor belt. Each one of these blowers is heating it up to 350 degrees. It comes out, again, roughly 350 degrees into this water bath. Now the water bath, it actually isn't as cold as I thought. I thought it'd be really cold. It's roughly room temperature. I think they said 62, 63 degrees. At the end of this, there's an air dryer. Blow all the water off of it, clean it up, and then it's gonna come across this trolley system into this weaver that's going to just sit and coil it up really nice and pretty. So when the coil is done, they'll go ahead and pause, cut it. This rolls out, they'll unload it over to a bin similar to this. So this is, guys, from for a fence guy, this system is just incredibly interesting i have never really seen where vinyl extruded wire comes from but here it is here's the end result now this will either go into uh weaving wire for chain link mesh or it can also uh, get turned into black vinyl coated steel uh, wire ties hook ties so yeah thought you guys might like a sneak peek into this all right guys so that's a quick look on what makes these wire weaving machines work how they tick i tell you what it's a, still a little bit like magic even though i watched the whole thing happen it it still is a little bit mystifying to me. If you guys have any sort of questions or comments about how the machines work, drop them in the comments below. I'd love to talk to you guys there. I know I thanked you in the beginning, but I want to thank you again for having me out. This is an impressive operation. I am blown away. Well, thank you. And thank you for coming out. It was nice having you. <laughs> yeah, I had a great time. I really did. Yeah. Well, guys, I'm Joe Evers, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors. Now all right, let me know what you guys thought about the uh, that Burgundy wire weaving machine. It is it is incredible to see those things running, and especially that so that vinyl extrusion machine. That thing was wild as well it, to make sure. And he went into a little bit more detail off after we we're done filming. the 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 links they go to to make sure the core is perfectly in the center of that vinyl extrusion is pretty crazy too. And they'll do, they do quality tests where they'll snip from time to time. They'll snip that wire to make sure that the wire is perfectly centered within that core, that the core is basically the core is being poured evenly over the, uh, or the vinyl is being poured evenly over that core. 
it was it was impressive to see. Uh, and so one of the things we did while we were up there is uh, Brissa and I had a, had more of a conversation. This was filmed back when we were still considering getting a machine, a wire weaving machine. And um, and that's one of the conversations I had with them when uh, we were talking on the phone was I said, hey, guys, just full transparency. Uh, I'm thinking about getting one of these machines. So I would love to come up and just learn from your guys' experience with the machines. I mean, obviously do the videos, but learn from your guys' experience with the machines too. Uh, I don't want you to hear that I'm getting a machine later on and think that this was like me coming here to to learn, to only to learn about the machines. Anyway, they were totally gracious. I said, come up, we'll run you through the machines, good, bad, and ugly, let you see exactly how the things run. So um, I know where, let me get back to it. So Roger had said uh, he follows them on LinkedIn. Um if you guys are looking for, you know, uh, chain link wire, that sort of thing, you should check out Brenton Manufacturing. Actually, we just got a load of uh, six foot nine gauge in from them last week, week before. Um, good wire, really good wire, really good quality. The weave is good. So you guys should check them out. Uh, it was, they were incredibly helpful to me. I appreciate that. So I had, uh, wanted you guys to meet them as well. Let me scroll back because I saw Will said he subscribed. Will. Welcome to the fence, fam. You're in. Uh, so talking about the fence that he was moving, I he said, okay, I appreciate it. I had to rush and put this up, this up six years ago. Totally common. Uh, when we bought the house to have a containment for the dogs. Three things to keep a fence company in business. Kids, pets, and bad neighbors. That's it. Well, maybe not that's it, but those are the three key things. Totally normal. Had a dog need to build a fence. Uh, now I regret not taking the time to place it on the true property line. It happens. And Will, so the property line thing happens more than you'd think, too. You know, a lot of homeowners don't want to go through the expense of having a survey uh, made of the property because, you know, maybe two or three of the pins are there. So if there's, you know, especially if there's three there, if two of the right pins are there, then you can kind of triangulate where that last one would be to find the corner. Um, but so they don't have a survey done. Right, or at least they don't have the pins marked. So that's typically what we would do. We wouldn't go through the entire cost of having a full-blown survey that's like registered with the county. We would still use a surveyor, but they would come out and locate the property pins. And if there's not one, then they would place like a wooden stake where that pin should be. Um, but it's really common. A lot of homeowners don't even want to go to that expense. So the, they'll place the fence where they're pretty sure that fence, that property line is. Unfortunately, Sometimes that's not where that property line was. So don't feel too bad about it. Um, it happens. It absolutely does. But now you got a chance to fix it, right? So uh, let me know if we can help you as you're going through that. Roger said he follows them online. I would. I do too. Uh, Brenton Manufacturing. I I pretty much like all of their content on there. Uh, they've got good stuff. I, I just think it's interesting watching that machine run. Like I really, after these machines come in, I could see myself just sitting and staring at this thing running. Uh, that's pretty much what I'm what I'm planning on doing. Divine Fence says, "Hello, Joe and Fence fam. Hope everyone is doing well. Looking forward to another great season. Couldn't agree more. We we're having that conversation earlier that it seems like the season is off to a strong start." Adam, what is up, Adam Sims? Adam has we said this last week, but Adam has the best fence hats ever. Uh, we do very little chain link. We do. Do you build your walk gates or by prefab? Uh, we had a repair where the gates look like they were pieced together with elbows and pipe. Yep. So that's one way of fabricating. So we fabricate, we weld them together. We've got a, a weld shop, a fabrication shop. But before, so when I was a kid, actually one of my first jobs here was fabricating gates using the corners that you saw. Um, the pain is that, well, Depends. I mean, the ones we were using were aluminum gate corners, uh, really common in the industry. They crack a lot. So that was always a pain. Uh, you'd had, it was, it was really hard getting them to stay square. You'd square it and you'd tighten down the bolts and you'd square it again and kind of put some leverage on it. Um, as, as I grew up, we uh, went ahead and invested in a uh, piece of welding equipment, a Millermatic, um, and started fabricating them. Uh, just by welding them. And that was one of my later jobs was welding in the fabrication shop. But um, yeah, so we fabricate our own. We also fabricate for others. Uh, so there's uh, fence companies in our town that don't have the facilities or the the want to fabricate their own, but they also don't want to buy prefab. Uh, they want to set their post and then have a gate built for that opening. So we do quite a lot of that as well. 
M um, says also to repair chain link, we can we can just take a strand and weave it through two sections to keep from having to replace the whole mesh. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think what you're talking about is just joining two pieces of wire. Um, so like when we have a longer run, when we have, say, I don't know, a couple hundred foot run, uh, that's how we weave these pieces together. So um, I should have pieces of chain link up here to demonstrate this, but I don't. So typically you cannot have two elbows of the diamond go together, right? You can't weave that together. So one of it has to be a half diamond and the other has to be a full diamond. And then you can weave a strand in there together. And as long as you knuckle it well, uh, and now the twisting is a little different, but if it's knuckle knuckle, like if it's on residential, typically it's knuckle knuckle, meaning two pieces that are turned over each other instead of two twisted pieces. Um, as long as you knuckle it right, you won't even notice the difference. So yes, you can. So like on a repair, that's typically what we would do. Uh, if they're, you know, if it's a cut portion of the fence, that's even easier. We would take out a couple weaves, weave in a couple more and we're done. Or if it's a damaged portion of the fence, we would just cut out the bat. We would unweave two strands or two pickets right where that damage on either side of the damage. And we take a new piece, place it in, weave it back, tension the whole thing again, and you're done. Josh says, that was really cool to see the process. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I agree. Like I said, I, I could sit and watch that thing. I did sit and watch that thing run for most of a day. I've just uh, learn about it and just watch it run. It's like for, for a uh, mechanically minded person, like it is wild. The wild part is to sit and watch it and think somebody came up with this, right? Like someone came up with a process to run smooth steel through a worm drive surrounding a rectangle tooling and they could turn this thing into mesh right and then they could they figured out how to get two of them to do it at the same time so now they're weaving two at the same time this thing is is crazy to me it really really is but um yeah it's and, and to program and have it be automated to a large extent now you still have to have a technician sitting there with it to make sure that, you know, it's not misweaving. It doesn't need any small adjustments. The turrets are hitting correctly as far as knuckling or twisting. All of that can come out of adjustment, just needs to be readjusted. Um, but yeah, it's for a mechanically minded person, it is crazy to watch. I really, really enjoyed it. And I mean, honestly, that's going to be part of the content that we bring you guys is seeing how this machine runs right so you're going to be able to see us getting into the new property and so i'm not sure yeah i mean we're going to start filming this somewhat soon so you're going to see us get into the new property or take over the new property uh we're going to have to make some modifications to it right uh, we're going to, have to bring in we're going to the full service electrical it needs 460 uh so we're going to bring in full service electric we're going to receive the machinery so that's still out a little ways, but you're going to see us receive the machinery, assemble the machinery, place it, and then start learning about how this machinery works. Now, part of uh, buying these machines is Burgandy sends a technician out to basically train you and your people on how that machine works. Now, you can you can send your people to Burgandy for a lower cost, but part of them coming out and training us on our piece of machinery is also doing some quality control, just checking that we put this thing together correctly. Right? So this is the first one we've ever put together. And I'm sure the instructions come are very clear, but I've been known to mess up some Ikea furniture. So I can't imagine what this thing is going to turn out like. So they're going to fly out a trainer and train us on our piece of equipment, get it dialed in just like it needs to get dialed in and then turn us loose. You're going to watch that whole process. You're going to watch us make our first roll of wire, which we were talking about a few shows ago, and I've been talking about the guys in the shop. We're going to figure out a way, that first roll, we're going to find a way to mount it up in the shop, like on the side of the building. First roll ever, here it is sort of thing. Um, you're going to watch that. You're going to watch us have our first customer, right? So you're going to, you're going to be able, you're going to be in the viewership seat to watch all that happen, and I can't wait to bring you into that. You're also going to see, what it's like just running this place on a daily basis about the team we have put together 
whether it's Sarah running our residential division or my dad, Jim, running our commercial division or Candace running our retail wholesale. She had an incredibly busy week. It was a crazy week for her this week. You're going to get to sit in on all of it, right? Now, it's going to be a little bit maddening on our end to try to figure out which direction to, to video at any given time because there's always moving pieces here. I think that's going to be part of the fun. Uh, so you guys are going to be able to, to watch that process work. Can't wait to bring you into it. Adam Sims, you're very welcome. He says, thank you, Joe Evers. Chainlink is not allowed by HOAs here. We're much the same. So uh, in our area, HOAs require six-foot wood fence. Well, mm, there's one that requires six-foot vinyl, actually. So most of it's six-foot wood. Now we're working on them. So the neighborhood I moved into, well, and here's a, here's a funny thing, is when you move into these, like you know there's an HOA, like they tell you, there's an HOA. Like, oh, okay, well, where are the stipulations? Well, in a buyer's market that we were in where we weren't taking any time to go through anything, we wanted this house, we wanted a house. This house fit what we needed, right? Uh, and we were making offers on a spot. Now, this was before the current, this was four years ago, before the current madness we're in the middle of. But anyway, had an HOA. Now, I did not put two and two together that this entire neighborhood had shadow box fence. So we lived in an HOA that required shadow box fence. Now, I understand what you're saying right now. Joe, you're a fence guy, and you knowingly moved into a neighborhood that had shadow box fence. Are you a madman? The answer is I didn't know, okay? But I figured it out. I got on the board. I was like, guys, we need to do something about the shadow box fence business. It's not good. It costs more to the residents. It doesn't provide any sort of privacy unless you're directly on. And the upkeep on mowing and weed eating these things is a nightmare. So instead of weed eating it, you're pretty much all either letting it go, letting grass grow up between the pickets, or you're spraying some sort of grass killer under it. Not a great idea when you have kids and pets and all that. Let's be done with this nonsense and go with the true privacy fence. So we got that done. And then I started another, I, we started our retail wholesale. So then I had to sit down, I had to step down off the board. So I'm sure to a lot on the board, it looked like, it looked like I showed up to get shadow box fences taken out. And then I stepped down, which effectively that is kind of what happened, but that was not my pure intention. I did get on there. I did get on the board to try to get the shadow box stuff out, but I was also planning on staying for quite a while. Anyway. Um, yeah. Chain link is not allowed by any of the HOAs in our area. Like it is absolutely not. Uh, but we have we have a fair amount of neighborhoods that aren't regulated by an HOA. So here's the thing: lately, is there's been um, there's been a lot of HOAs that have just been um, disbanding, right? So they didn't have enough they didn't have enough uh, residents interested in keeping it going. Uh, there weren't there's not infrastructure in these, like such as a pool or common space. And the developer has left this neighborhood quite like the developer has finished the neighborhood. And moved on so the develop like so in our neighborhood the developer's about half done um i think we were phase two of six or seven so he's now like through phase three or four he might be half done more than half done anyway he's still got some houses left to build though um so he's like i think he holds 51 percent of the seats on the homeowner association but once he's done developing then he'll turn those over to the board um anyway a lot of neighborhoods are are leaving the hoa system or or not having an HOA. We still do a fair amount of chain link, especially on the commercial side. The commercial, I want to say like our commercial business is probably 90% chain link. I'd have to go look at the numbers. We do a little bit of wood. Uh, we actually just got done with a nice wood project uh, for a commercial client for a uh, dealership here in town. Uh, it was a Cadillac dealership. So I was like, oh, maybe we'll just trade us a car for some fence or something. But uh, I was informed that Cadillacs are also in short supply. So, and I don't know, I don't know that, that uh, wood pickets would strap very well to the top of like a escalator or something. So anyway, we just built them a wood fence a, that they're painting gray. Come to find out. So anyway, um, yeah, chain link's not allowed by HOAs. Same. A lot. I don't know that there's an HOA out there that would allow chain link fence. You pretty much are, are fairly against it. But anyway, guys, here we are two hours and 18 minutes into this thing out of two hours and 30 minutes. My uh, Missouri math tells me we've got about 12 minutes left in this thing. So uh, if you got any last minute questions, concerns, input, drop those in the comments below. We've got seven likes and hearts. Let's see who I'm calling you out. 
All right. Hearts. Oh, still my wife. Okay. That makes sense. Totally. Ma totally makes sense. All right. Likes are Adam Sims, Josh Rand, Ashley Roth, Stain and Still Experts, Michael Taylor, and Defense Industry Podcast with Dan Wheeler. Thank you guys for liking. All of the rest of you that have been commenting, but I haven't called your name, noted. That's all I'm saying. Noted. So go ahead and feel free to hit that like button now. I don't know what kind of list I'm keeping or where I'm keeping it, but you don't want to be on it, right? Uh, also, if you haven't subscribed, let's scroll back up here. I don't want to get the name wrong. Will, I think it's, yeah. Don't You need to be like Will. Be more like Will. Subscribe to the channel. It really does mean a lot. We're at like 37,000 subscribers, I think. Holy camoly. That's a lot. But I think we could find more people to invite into the Fence Fan to be a part of this thing. If you're watching and you've not subscribed, please consider subscribing. And when you do subscribe, be sure to hit the notification bell so that you're notified each and every week when we have new content available. I got good at saying that for a while. I think we're going to get back to saying that in the videos because... Here's the thing. So you go to, I went to social media marketing world where it's all about social media marketing. And you hear people that say, so the reason I stopped saying it is I was listening to a lot of the industry experts say, stop saying it. Like it takes up time out of the video. People know what they're supposed to do. If they're going to do it, if they want to do it, they're going to do it. That's kind of what they said. Well, then this time we're there and it's people saying you should invite people, people to subscribe because sometimes they don't think about it. It, and this is real. Like it shows up on your YouTube, like new to you. YouTube is a whole section, right? So somebody's watching it. They don't realize, hey, I'm not subscribed. I should subscribe. But by calling it out, you make it more noticeable and you prompt them into action. So we're going to start that up again until the next expert tells us that we should probably stop doing it. And then we will probably stop doing it. I don't know. But we're always trying to figure out the best way to have content for you guys. Bo Butler, what is up? Speaking of somebody we haven't heard from in a while, I sometimes get jealous hearing how simple other markets are for the same style of fence. We have 25 different outlines for just privacy fences. From 4x4 four four to 8x8 eight eight posts, 2x4 two to 2x8 two rails, 2x4 two to 2x8 two caps. 25 different types of privacy fence. Bo, that is wild. That is really wild. Like, I knew cap and trim was a thing. Like, not in our market, but I knew... It, here's what's funny. So, you go like an hour and a half over into Oklahoma, cap and trim is totally a thing. Not a thing here. Uh, I I brought it up at one of the home shows and was told it, it was not a thing here. So, we tried it. We, we put it out there in the market, and when they heard the cost involved with it, they weren't interested. So, we do privacy and shadow box. That's on board on board which is kind of like same side shadow box. Um, we do those here, but I can't imagine 25 different styles of privacy fence. That is crazy. Four before four, eight by eight posts, two before two byte rails, two before two, two by eight caps. Like just trying to keep all that straight. Bo, I am, I don't know. How do you do it? Like the organization, it has to be organization, right? It has to be clear and concise work orders. It has to be detailed scope of work. Good on you. Good on you for figuring that out. I I mean, we could figure it out if we had to, but holy cow, 25 for just for privacy. So then you have the whole mess for Shadowbox too, I'm sure. And the whole mess for, you could have, you could easily have 100 different SKUs, like for different types of fence. I could not imagine trying to build that system out. Good on you for that. Do we have any more likes? I'm looking at you guys right now. Let's see. No. All right, so I'm not going to go through the list and call people out today, but maybe that's a future thing. I don't know. We'll see. All right, guys, two minutes, two, two minutes, two hours, 23 minutes. I think we're just about done. I think we have run. I have, I have gone on about nothing for the last several minutes, and I think we're about done with that. So unless there's any last-minute comments, questions, et cetera, which – it bears repeating that even after this live, it goes on to a recording. So you can leave comments in the recording. It does come to me in the comment section of my YouTube app. Now, I do my best to keep up with all of the comments in the YouTube app. But holy cow, sometimes there are a lot. And I I try really hard. That's 
actually kind of what I do also in the evening. So you might notice a lot of the comments come in the evenings because I'm sitting on the porch, smoking a cigar, replying to, you know, YouTube comments while I'm watching YouTube. So it's kind of like a conundrum sort of thing. But anyway, uh, I try to keep up. I really do. But sometimes there, when a video is going really well, there are a lot of comments. So just bear with me. I do answer all of them as I can. So with all that being said, yeah, Roger says like. Let's let's see. Did Roger like? Roger. Oh, actually, Roger's on YouTube. So I think I think this is only showing me. Okay. I need to back up. I apologize, Roger. Guys, getting ready to call Roger out. This only shows me face. It says Facebook likes. And then it says uh, Facebook loves the hearts. And I'm pretty glad it's only my wife on there. Okay. So this isn't YouTube interactions. I apologize. I just got on to you guys about not liking it. And you're probably sitting there saying, Joe, I have. And you didn't call my name. I'm sorry. It only shows me Facebook likes, apparently. YouTube needs to find a way through API to let me know who on YouTube land. Can I do it through my streaming app? Let me see. Hold one. Um, no, doesn't show me. Uh, top chats. Let's see. Nope. Trying to see, so there's so off screen. I've got a, I've got a screen here that's showing me like the the live analytics of the YouTube, but it does not show me. It shows me concurrent viewers and views and view durations, and it shows me the chat. Um, but yeah, does not show me who has interacted. Maybe let me see, participants. Nope. Okay, that's not what I wanted. All right, so it doesn't show. But Roger has. Roger has given it a heart. Now, Roger, okay. So it is now Roger and my wife that have hearted this. And you just take that for what it's worth. I don't know. Um, guys, I do appreciate you guys showing up each and every week. Roger, Josh, I mean, all Adam. I should. I need to stop naming names because I then at some point I stop and I've forgotten somebody. They feel hurt. I am sorry. I appreciate everyone for coming in every, each and every week. It really does make this feel more like a community is what Roger was saying earlier, right? About the fence fan being, you know, a real community that of, of fence professionals and non fence professionals alike, people that just enjoy fencing content. I appreciate it. I'm here for you guys. If you guys have any comments, suggestions, etc., drop them in the comments below. I always love to interact with you guys, even when it's not live next week, actually for the next several weeks, we're going to have lives. Um, so two weeks from now is the HBA home show, but I'm going to be doing this live because I'm interviewing uh, or interviewing, just talking with having on uh, Chris Caruso with Caseric Distributors, who we're going to go see May 6th in Philadelphia for some live training. So we'll be talking about that, what to expect, that sort of thing uh, in two weeks. So we'll be on here for a while. Actually, probably until we won't, we will not be here on, let's see, if the training is May 6th, then we will not be here May 7th, which would be a Saturday, the Saturday before Mother's Day, because I will be traveling back to be with Taylor and my mom for Mother's Day. So anyway, we'll be here for a while. Can't wait to see you guys next week. Until next time, I'm Joe Evers, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors, and I'll see you next week.